Good morning, Bermuda. Stand up. Woo, by Cynthia Arrivo. Wow, that was a powerful song. Welcome, everybody. First of all, happy Father's Day to everybody out there. Um, and obviously, uh, I hope everyone's enjoying their Sunday so far. Um, just a few things that we're going to be talking about today. Obviously, there's some hot topics. Uh, I kind of like to, to wait till, till Sunday so we can gather all the information and have lots to talk about. Um, but we have Eugene Dean here. We have Dr. Stillman that will be tuning in around 10.30 this morning. Um, and we're going to be t covering the 14-day quarantine. Uh, Dr. Stillman's going to give us some input on lockdowns, coercion, travel restrictions. We're also going to get an update from uh, Mark Pettingill and... Possibly Aaron Hill. I'm not quite sure if he'll be able to call in, but Mark Pettingill will be tuning in, and he'll be calling us around 11 o'clock to give us an update on the court case. Um, again, if you are just tuning in, remember you can reach me on the outlet 2021 on all the social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram. Also remember, uh, when you can, any amount is is fantastic to, to uh, donate to the Crowd Justice Fund to go towards the court case. Um, also remember beyondthepandemic.tv, they actually released their episode five, I think it was on Friday, which was fantastic. Uh, if you do want to tune into Vibe 103, remember you do not have to sit in your car, you can, in, you can tune in on the app, uh, or on TuneIn, or on our website using Chrome or Safari, which is vibe103.com. And again, the hotline, if you're just tuning in, is 232-1033. And we will be opening the lines, uh, and I'll, I'll make sure to let the listeners know. But Eugene, go ahead. Do you want to do a little introduction? All right. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, Bermuda. First of all, I'd like to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, and I want to say a special happy Father's Day to, to my father and also to my daughter because um, she's the reason that I was ushered into the role of fatherhood myself, which has been a huge learning curve and a great you know, opportunity for me to develop and grow as a person. So I give thanks for my family and, and for all families in Bermuda and you know, again, all fathers. So that, that's why we're here today because we're here to talk about our people we're here to talk about our communities. We're here to talk about our families. And what I will say to everyone is that we recognize that concerns have been rising over a considerable amount of time. But the good thing is that the tide is actually rising. There's been a shift. There's been a definite shift. And, and I like to take the opportunity to give thanks to all those who have contributed to that shift. So, you know, over a month ago, the atmosphere in the community was totally different. There was a lot of fear, a lot of apprehension. There were a lot of conversations that were happening underground in chat groups, social media groups, and things of that nature, but very little, if anything, was getting above ground. However, there were a few brave souls who were being vocal Mark Bean being one of them, Tiny T, um, Antonio Belvedere, you know, um, they were out in the front lines, you know, speaking. And, and then you started to hear other voices emerge. And Zara, you know, one of the most freaking voices that everyone's hearing on the voice notes. I'm sure everybody knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> the famous voice notes that have been going around, you know? So, and Dwayne, I really give thanks for, for the role that you've played because, you know, although, you know, everyone may not have heard, I, I don't know, maybe you have to be hiding under a rock not to be able to hear <laughs> Dwayne Santusha's voice notes, but you've really like helped to awaken a lot of people and stimulated a lot of energy in the community. And so I remember it was probably just over a month ago when the Bermuda Freedom Alliance reached out to me and asked me if I'd be willing to come on the radio and speak. And I asked them at that time, what was their main focus? They had already had one car rally that was very successful. And 
it was being labeled in the community as this kind of like anti-vaxxer rally, this anti-mass rally, and people were being very negative towards what was going on. And when I spoke to them, I realized that their main concern was around, right, discriminatory mandates and policies. And I said to them, you know, if, if your focus is discrimination, then that's something that I'm, I'll gladly represent, you know, and I feel like that's something that the whole community would embrace because we've all seen or experienced discrimination in our lifetimes. And what I know from my experience, I've yet to see a positive outcome at the end of it, you know, and I'm sure everyone will have to agree that that is the case. Now, you know, I want to also give thanks to, and I know this is kind of like, you know, you, you don't do this, in the, in the media industry, but, but I hope you guys don't mind. But <laughs> Glenn Blakeney is somebody who was out front early as well. Mm -hmm. And he was allowing conversations on his radio station, you know, on Magic 102.7, you know, and he had people like Dr. Darlin and Dr. Connie Frith. They had their shows running. And he also was inviting people on his own show. You know, he had doctors from overseas, people locally, and they were speaking up. And this again, this is in the early days. You know, so I appreciate it. And he was actually the first one to invite me to speak on, on the radio. So I'm thankful, you know. And when I went on that show, I remember saying, where are the MPs? Where are they? Because they all can agree. Where are the backbenchers? I mean, we have people um, there that are in the house. They're in caucus. You know, these conversations are coming through and around about where are they? You know, so it's interesting that today we sit her now and those voices are starting to emerge. Voices are emerging out of the house. Voices are emerging out of the BIU. Doctors have come to the forefront to speak on these matters, which has had a huge impact. We released a TV series, you just talked about it, Zara beyond the pandemic. And that has brought doctors to the forefront because even doctors were silent. Even though this is a medical or health-related scenario, you had doctors who were afraid to speak their truth, to tell their experiences and things of that nature. So again, I'm thankful for those doctors for coming forward. And as a result of all of you who have worked hard to contribute to this conversation, we now actually have a conversation going on in the community. We actually have that conversation. And that is the blessing. The fact that we actually have this conversation going on in the community right now. You know, so, so I really give thanks again to all the trailblazers. I give thanks to all the people who have been assisting thus far. I thank you for everyone who is in the background and the foreground helping with Beyond the Pandemic. And most importantly, I thank you guys here at Vibe 103 for creating the outlet and giving us this opportunity to speak to the community, you know? So um, that's, that's kind of like my opening remarks. And I just want to add on that what we're really pushing back on is extremely challenging. The concerns are flying in. My phone's ringing off the hook, right? The pressure is increasing. Mothers are crying out. Families are crying out. Young people are crying out. This mandate that is forcing people to pay to be in a luxury hotel for two weeks because of travel is a major issue. But the bigger thing is that, is that all of these mandates that's coming down the pipeline right now are dividing the country. The messaging that's coming from authorities has been very misleading. In one sense, we're saying that, right, it's actually not legal to ask people about their medical history. But in the other sense, 
We're asking people when they get to the airport to disclose that. Now, I remember in one of the press conferences, it was said, you know, by the media, somebody from Royal Gazette asks, what happens if, what happens if someone who's going into the hospital for surgery is concerned about the people working on them in the hospital all being vaccinated? The answer that was given is that we cannot ask people about their medical status. It's a legal issue. Yet we're ruling out all these policies that are asking that. We are saying that if you are vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine in a facility that you have to pay for. You can go home, whether you have a positive or a negative test. We are saying that we want all hospital staff or hotel staff to take tests on a weekly basis. Oh, no, actually, we're not saying that. We're saying that we want all unvaccinated mm-hmm. hotel staff to take tests on a schedule. But if you're vaccinated, somehow you got to pass. So now we've created this thing where there's benefits associated with you going and taking the jab. And there are disadvantages associated with not. And you're also setting an example that's suggesting to the general public that it's okay to discriminate. And as a result, now you see discrimination happening on all different levels, right? Another thing that's been very misleading is that authorities... And doctors have been making very broad statements about the safety of the COVID jab. They're making statements that we are all hard-pressed to back up with actual tangible data. It's been very misleading. And now data is emerging about adverse effects. And what's become clear is that there is a definite initiative to suppress that information. We've been through a year and a half of everything seemingly negative about COVID being reported repeatedly. You don't hear a whisper in the media about adverse effects, not a whisper. Yet it's happening. What we do know is that anything held on against his will in time will rise effortlessly. And that's what's happening. The stories are emerging. Because remember, in order for all these things to happen, it requires our people. In order for these discriminatory mandates to work, it requires our people to actually, right, make those policies work against their own. And the people who are actually having to be put in positions to execute these mandates have families, have friends have work colleagues that are compromised as a result of them. Now, we may be able to save face initially, but over time, what's going to happen? That's going to start to wear down on people's conscience. And that's what's happening. And so stories are emerging. There was a headline in the newspaper that suggested that the death rate in Bermuda in 2020 Rose. So again, it's misleading because nobody's saying, and I'll say this, right? As a result of all this, we've had to have a lot of people working in the background. So now we have a team that just reviews data and looks at statistics. And what's left out in that headline or that article is the fact that the death rate in Bermuda has been rising steadily since 2011. If you look at the data, it's a constant uptick. And that is due to a number of factors. You also have a scenario where the premier has come out and made a statement about what he figures is going to happen in the winter and putting everybody on notice about an outbreak. So the media, I would say, let's start asking some questions. Where is that advice coming from? Is that advice coming from the health department? And if it is coming from the health department, 
Where is the data to show that that's going to happen? And if it isn't coming from the health department, where is it coming from? Who's advising the premier to make statements like that? Statements have also been made at the press conferences to suggest that we haven't had people flying away for adverse effects. We haven't had people being treated at the hospital for adverse effects. This is not the case. The data is emerging. And again, you can ask people who work at the hospitals. You can ask the EMTs. You can even ask the families. And maybe it would take the families actually coming to the forefront and telling those stories for people to actually know the truth. But why is the truth not being revealed? Why is it not being reported? That's the real question. What is really going on with that? So anyway, I'll just close out by saying that for all those who came out in the beginning and were called anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers, conspiracy theorists, the data is emerging to support their claims. And more people are coming into the conversation. Now, in addition to people in the community, we have MPs, we have people from the union, right? The one missing faction that I would say is this. Outside of Maria Seaman, we have yet to hear from the churches. We're dealing with discrimination here. And that's a principle that I'm sure all the churches would have to agree that they would have a position on. It would have to be a concern. So this is an invitation to the churches to add your voices to the conversation. This is about Bermuda. This is not about who our families are. This is not about politics. This is not about race, gender, or class. This is about doing what is in the best interest of our country and its people. And in order to achieve that, we need everyone's support. Governments and authorities are put in place to serve our interests, not the reverse. I'll say that again. Governments and authorities are put in position to serve the interests of the people, not the reverse. How do we make sure that happens? Is all up to us. Give thanks. Thank you, Eugene. Um, very much. <laughs> uh, what uh, we'll do is, is we'll take a quick music break, and on the other side, we will have Dr. Stillman in tuned. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll have some, some questions for him and he can give us a little bit of his thoughts on, on, on the whole pandemic. All right, give thanks. <laughs> Them say tune in, vibes 103 I fig one, whoa yeah. Tune in, cause vibes 103 is on. Yeah, this is a sweet, sweet cockatee saying you're listening to vibes 103, Bermuda's energy station. Keep the thing locked it up there and can't come down. This is not a NASA satellite. <laughs> a cockatee, you must say bright. Kick it. I'm not perfect, I came from ruthless times I 
just tuned in welcome to the outlet um you can you can tune in either on the tune in app or you can go to vibe103.com using chrome or safari and again you could reach me on all social media platforms the outlet bda and remember beyond the pandemic tv uh, that episode was released on friday episode five Mm -hmm. Uh, again the hotline's 232-1033 for when i open up the lines but we actually have um Dr. Stillman on the line with us now. Good morning, Dr. Stillman. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Um, just so everybody knows, he is Dr. Stillman is based in Florida, and he became a doctor to help people achieve their highest potential. Whether you are struggling with a chronic illness or are seeking the next level of performance in your work, your relationships, or your vocations, he can help you achieve the excellent health that you desire and deserve. You probably realize that modern medicine is focused on treatments rather than cures. He has little interest in treating diseases. He is determined to cure diseases. Hippocrates, oh, excuse me, um, one of the history's greatest physicians said, the physician treats, but nature cures. And Dr. Stillman also believes this is possible even in seemingly incurable cases. So he completed medical school and specialized in internal medicine, and he chose to study natural and functional medicine. And when he works with his patients, he develops a comprehensive plan to restore and optimize one's health using the most scientifically advanced diagnostics and therapeutics available, alongside ancient healing practices that have stood the test of time. So welcome, Dr. Stillman. Whoa, what, what, what an introduction. Right, and if you do want to actually, ask, yeah, <laughs> and if you if you do want to go to his website, it's actually stillmanmd.com, and it's s t i l l m a n m d dot com. Um, so welcome, Dr. Stillman, again. Bermuda's listening, and they're actually they're probably pretty anxious to hear from you. If you if you don't mind, just uh, introducing yourself, and then of course uh, 
I have a couple of questions that I would love to ask you as well. Sure, yeah. I, mean, I don't know what else to say to add to that, uh, that introduction. Um, <laughs> like you said, I, I love helping people overcome their medical issues and creating wellness where there was illness. And that's what I'm all about. I'm totally dedicated to that. And that's why you know, I'm here this Sunday. Great. Um, how long have you been doing medicine? I graduated from medical school in 2014, so seven years now. Great. Um, have you ever been to Bermuda? Not yet. Oh, do you want to come right now and stay in a luxury hotel for 14 <laughs> days and, and pay for it or what? <laughs> That's right. It's really enticing. Yeah. Oh, sure yeah. It's just, just really, really making your tourism industry boom, right? Right, right. Um, uh, so funny enough, when I was actually reading about you, um, you did state that what intrigued you with your medicine was that, well, to get into medicine, sorry, is that you continuously suffered from ear and sinus infections and also ADHD. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind just giving a little bit of a story or background on that and that journey and how you actually addressed those issues to quote unquote cure, uh, cure them. Sure. Well, so when I was a little kid, uh, I ended up developing ear, sinus infections, things like that. We didn't actually cure those when I was a kid. I grew out of them. But the reality was I was left not a very powerful, strong, robust guy. I was like the last pick on the football field, last pick on the soccer field. It really frustrated me because I just have a mind that wants and a spirit that wants to achieve, that wants to overcome, that wants to be the best. I always wanted to be the best. And I still want that. And so I refused to settle. And I kept looking for answers. Why was I not who I wanted to be in my physical body. You know, why was my, you know, attention span all over the place? Why did I feel a certain way? And, you know, I decided I wanted to become a physician when I was about 15. So I'm about to be 33. I'll be 33 tomorrow. Thank you. So, you know, something like 18 years into this journey, I've been looking for all the best of whatever you want to call it, East, West, natural, conventional, orthodox, unconventional, uh, holistic, functional, all these are, when you get really into, into medicine, you realize all these different words that people use to describe their medicine are just, uh, they're buzzwords, they're marketing terms. At the end of the day, it's all about what helps people live their best life and be their best self. And that's what I've been spending the last 18 years putting together as a, as a toolbox, so to speak, of different things that I can share with my patients to help them achieve excellence. Fantastic. Um, I know everyone's listening in that because they, you know, there's obviously a lot to cover. But just to bounce off what you what you're talking about, um, and just maybe if if the listeners would uh, love to hear this little story of mine, I, I'll try to make it very short. Uh, our son, who's now seven, mm -hmm. he um, ended up having it was he was having problems with his ears, and it was continuous fluid buildup. So we uh -huh. were going back and forth, you know, and and. We, we were basically given a little bit of a scare that said, you know, if you don't get grommets and if you don't solve this fluid issue, um, he could potentially go deaf. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's a little bit of a scare. But, you know, as, as a mother, I have these innate feelings. And as um, people have been tuning into my show, I've been educating myself for the last seven years on holistic medicine. And my I, I held off and I held off and I said the, the more research I did myself um, it was brought to our attention it was a, probably about two or three summers ago because time now goes by so quickly and we were going to go and spend the summer in California well we did but prior to leaving um, the doctors here were pushing the grommets and said you know we really want to get this done before you go away and I was I, I thought to myself and I again I'm not a doctor but I thought to myself uh why would I want to put my son through that, especially right before summer? So that would be a nightmare to try to not, because based on what we were told, he wouldn't be able to go swimming and all that sort of stuff. So I said, no, 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 I'm just going to hold off. And every time I would go back, one ear would have more fluid than the other ear. Then it was the opposite. And then it was still, again, the scare of, oh, he, he, he could go deaf. And mm -hmm. I, the more, again, the more research that I did myself, I, it was stated that usually by the age of eight, the fluid should drain on its own. So it's, I've, 
people, obviously, there's no video on me, but if you could picture it, almost like your ear kind of tilting, 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 slowly, slowly draining. And then luckily, they actually drained on their own with no grommet or treatments at all. And so I was super happy about that. But in that experience, was that the right thing to do in that moment to wait it out? And then let's say this the fluid was still there and we were still potentially being uh, told that he could lose his hearing. Um, what options do people have in that regard if they're faced with the same situation? So uh, not to practice medicine via the radio, but um, here's yeah, the yeah. deal with <laughs> ear infections that it, that totally fascinates me. A couple of years ago, well, I guess now it's four or five. It's amazing how time flies when you're really busy trying to figure out how to get people well. But I found this guy's research. His name's David Hurst. He's an MD, PhD, ear, nose, and throat doctor. And he did these studies on uh, ear infections in children where he treated them for allergies with allergy shots. And he got an 80% remission rate to their ear infections. Hold the phone. 80% of these kids, he eliminated their infections by treating their allergies. Why is this not well known? It's not widely known because let's be honest. Surgeons get paid to put in ear tubes and allergists get paid to treat people for allergies with allergy shots. But unfortunately, the allergists are also being sort of co-opted by the pharmaceutical industry that's making a lot of money. And I mean a lot of money by not curing allergies using allergy shots, but managing them with very expensive, cutting edge monoclonal um, pharmaceutical drugs. And I was in an allergy training program. It became clear to me that we were passing over some of the best therapeutics in the world that were free and totally available to people and really simple too, in favor of these, I mean, I think just this overly complicated paradigm of drug therapy. This is very well you know, uh, established in the literature. This is not just my you know, opinion. Uh, and, and I see case after case after case where if you do some very simple things, you can see amazing things happen to people's, you know, ear, nose, throat complaints. I'll give you an example. A recent case that I saw was a, a mother brought her you know, child to see me. He had very severe eczema. Eczema is linked to ear infections. It's linked to allergies. It's linked to sinusitis, rhinitis, wow. all these other different, yeah, yeah, um, complaints. And what she found well, what I told her to do is I was like, listen, this could be an air quality issue in your house. I don't know what it could be. His allergy testing may be falsely negative. In other words, the tests are negative, but he's still got a problem. I want you to take a vacation. I tell almost all my patients, I want them to take a vacation somewhere to see if their environment is the issue. They go to Florida for a week. This kid's skin completely clears up, brings tears to his mother's eyes. And now the family dogs that they love very, very much are living in the garage instead of in the house. And the kid's skin is totally clear. And people just ignore this stuff. They just don't want to, and doctors don't have any incentive to cure these problems. They have an incentive to manage them, which is just the, the just a dark fact about medicine and about human nature. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, so let's get on the on, on to the topics in Bermuda. Um, we have about. To be exact, 55.4% of the population that have received two doses, mm -hmm. whether it was Pfizer, AstraZeneca, or Moderna. Mm -hmm. um, has, based on that, has Bermuda reached herd immunity? That's a great question. And the obvious question for me to ask you is, what proportion of the population of Bermuda has T or B cell mediated immunity against COVID-19? And that's the, ver you mean antibodies, correct? Yeah. Well, I don't mean antibodies. I mean so antibodies and T cells. Yeah. So that, that I wanted to extend on that mm -hmm. and basically say, you know, if we have about 55% that are, that have received the jab mm -hmm. um, and a huge population, including potentially the people that have received the jab, mm -hmm. that have gotten COVID-19, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be kind of common sense that combination of the vaccine and the antibodies, we've reached herd immunity? That would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? I would think so, but I mean, someone once taught me a long time ago and said to me, common sense isn't so common though, Zara. 
It's a, it's the truth. Yeah. Um, and and I don't understand why there's very little options or it's being not be, being available to people that are requesting for the antibody test. Um, I entirely agree with you. And I, I, to me, that could be my quote unquote vaccine passport, couldn't it? Why not? And the other question is, I just, I really want to know why the government hasn't addressed this at all here in Bermuda, even worldwide. I mean, what, what's, uh, what's your take on the government's worldwide addressing the antibodies issue? Do you, can you, can you elaborate on that or, or. Oh yeah. Happy to. So it's been astonishing to watch medical experts and governments basically ignore the fact that if you've had an infection, you are considered to be immune. That did not change in 2020, or it shouldn't have changed. But a lot of people are out there talking like natural immunity is irrelevant, and all that matters is the vaccine, which is insane. And you know, if you really want to know what's going to happen, you should probably start by studying history. And if we go back to the worst pandemic in, let's call it modern history, it was 1918, the uh, 1918 Spanish, so-called Spanish flu pandemic. And many, many, many more people died. It was a much more virulent disease. It was much more dangerous for young people than COVID-19. And guess what? In 18 months, around about, everything, all the mortality had tapered off. There was not any excessive mortality due to this virus. Now, why is that? Because viruses mutate, they become less virulent, they become less dangerous, and then they disappear and people no longer have issues with them. I mean, this is why... You know, for example, we're not getting vaccinated to the 1918 flu. We don't have a vaccine to it. Why? Because it is not a threat. These things come and they go. And the idea that COVID-19 is going to be some some kind of perpetual problem is this bizarre fabrication of these people who seem to not be consulting basic history books on the histories of pandemics. It just astonishes me that people are falling for this. There's so many vested interests that want people to get the vaccine because they're making an enormous amount of money off of increases in their stock prices and then just purely off of sales of a new product that they even got paid to research. And that, by the way, they're not liable for harms of, at least here in the United States. I don't know what the situation is in Bermuda or other uh, Commonwealth countries. Yeah, I mean, there there is a consent form that's given to the patients before getting the jab, um, which was actually discussed last Sunday. We had Dr. Um, Osser in here, and she was lovely. And she um, tapped into that, into the consent form here in Bermuda. It's about, I think, five pages long. And, you know, one of the things that were pointed out on it is it's, <laughs> you have... Uh, people here saying that the jab is completely safe for pregnant women and uh, women that would that would like to conceive children, but yet on the consent form, it said something along the lines of, and don't quote me on this, something along the lines where it says, in that same consent form, women who are pregnant should not receive this jab. So that's where it's very confusing. Um, what I'm going to do is, if it's okay, Dr. Stillman, I would love to open the lines to our listeners and let them engage with you for a few minutes and ask some questions, if that's okay? Fine with me. Okay, great. Again, um, if you're just tuning in, it's Dr. Stillman. Um, The hotline is 232-1033, and we'll take live calls. Good morning, Vibe 103. You're live. Hi, Zara. How are you? Good, thank you. Good, good. It's Ashley Tucker calling. Hello. Hi, I just wanted to let you know that it is uh, available, the procedure to get your blood drawn and tested for the antibodies. It's just a matter of discussing that with your GP, getting them to fill out a form. Once you get the form, you take that to um, BHB, King Edward, and, well, you have to make an appointment with the, the lab in King Edward. Then you go up to King Edward at your allocated time and they bill you, I think it's like $100 if you're uninsured and minuscule dollars if you're insured. So that's possible. Okay, It's available. Great. Yeah. So it's not it's free. Record. It's not free like the vaccine then? No, oh, no not at this point. Uh, dang. But anyways, you know, if you do want to um, investigate that, 
take control of that for yourself, that is possible. Thank you so much. I will. Thank you very much. And thank you for letting the listeners know as well. Absolutely. Have a good day. Thank Happy you. You as well. Day. Yes. Bye. Again, if you have any questions for Dr. Stillman, please feel free to call the hotline 232-1033 and he'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Stillman, um, so do you actually recommend that people who have received, sorry, that people who have the natural immunity to get the vaccine? Uh, no, I do not. I do not recommend that. I think that that makes no sense. Uh, you know, when, when the a body mounts immune response to anything, it's doing it with this incredible sensitivity and sophistication that we really struggle to, um, to, to even understand, let alone improve upon. And so the idea that something we make and inject into somebody is going to give them a better immune response, a more efficient, safe, powerful immune response than their own body is going to produce it is totally unsubstantiated in the literature and, and simply doesn't make any sense from a biological perspective. And that's what's so concerning to me about the lack of, uh, in the narrative of, a, of, a, of a, a role for natural immunity in achieving herd immunity. This used to be something that we just understood as, as given. And it's still in all the textbooks on my shelf about immunity and infectious disease. And the experts seem to be ignoring it because there's an agenda to vaccinate everyone. Okay, great. We actually have a call coming in. Good morning, Vibe 103. Yes, good morning. I have a question for the doctor. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so right now I have two relatives that have taken the jab. Um, they both live together. They took it sometime back, I think, in March. And right now they're experiencing a lot of abdominal pain with diarrhea. Um, if the doctor can more or less, I know it may vary to some, some of the adverse side effects of some people because of underlining issues that, that they may have um, previously. But if the doctor can um, talk more on the, some of the side effects that they commonly see among people in general, um, if that can be helpful as well. Okay, Dr. Stillman? Yeah, sure. So I think the question that came through to me from that was, you know, what are some of the common side effects from the uh, vaccines? And this is a loaded question because uh, really, I, I actually don't know what to tell people. And the reason I don't know what to tell people is that the VAERS database, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System in the United States, is not a publicly available database. We can see basic data coming through it. But it's also not a database that's really well known even to doctors. I did not know about this database until 2020, okay? That means that for most of my medical career, I practiced without ever even considering reporting a vaccine adverse event. And one of the things that people don't realize is that doctors don't ask about vaccination in relation to acute illness. And this last winter, I had a patient clearly tell me that they had stroke-like symptoms two days after their flu shot. Now, I can't prove the flu shot did that, nor do I have you know, anything other than the patient's opinion to uh, substantiate or suggest that it may have been related to the flu shot, right? But at the end of the day, if most doctors or even a small proportion of doctors don't even know this database exists, and if they're not being trained to ask questions like, could or did you have an, an immunization in the last couple of days that could be playing a role in your acute illness, then how can we possibly assume or expect for databases and public health authorities to be aware of potential complications and side effects of vaccines? Now, I realize the, the narrative is that vaccines are safe and effective. And I think, you know, I've had plenty of vaccines I'm up to date, except for my COVID shot, which I haven't gotten, won't get. And I haven't gotten my flu shot for, you know, last year, I'm not getting it this year. But the point is simply this, we cannot trust the data on this because it's not being recorded in a robust way. And the few people I've seen with um, vaccine complications or potential injuries, let's say, because again, I can never prove the vaccine you know, caused these symptoms. They may be totally unrelated to the vaccine, right? Uh, they've had issues with you know, chest pain, um, which may, may be some kind of myocarditis, as we've seen recently reported in uh, 
in the news. And the CDC is about to have a big meeting on that. Um, uh, lots of um, uh, thrombotic events, ischemic events, things where people are having clotting and blood flow issues. Uh, and then, you know, GI issues such as you've alluded to, I think that's what the caller was, was mentioning. Um, I haven't heard a lot about that. But the thing is, these products have are, are new, they're experimental. Uh, we don't really know what to expect in terms of their their side effects, which is why you know typically the the approval process for vaccines is much lengthier than was done with uh, these vaccines. Yeah, I, and I think that's where it makes it really difficult because you know, and it really does because if something does happen, first of all, you have to you have to sign a waiver or, or consent form, basically saying you know, if anything happens to you, we're not responsible. But then if something does happen to an individual, it's so difficult to prove that it was the vaccine. You know, I have a story where um, a friend of a friend, her daughter has a son, was perfectly fine up until he was two years old. And all of a sudden, when he was two, he just stopped speaking. And then he started bouncing off the walls. And it Uh was almost just like someone had injected a ton amount of drugs into this little boy's Uh system. And when they had done blood work, they realized the, the... large amounts of aluminum and mercury and and all the ingredients that if you research you know about them that are in these vaccines but if you ask you're not told and so they had to basically do a detox on this little boy and it was almost as if a it was treating a ex heroin addict because he was just coming down and and all the toxins were being released from this little boy's body and when I hear those stories it's so sad but what I have heard and also read about the the reason why this particular quote-unquote vaccine is different is because you can't get rid of it once it's in your system and I've also just it who was it it was Dr. I wish I had one of the clips. I can't remember his name right now. Um, but his name was Dr. Bryden or something. It was an overseas doctor. Uh, from Guelph? Yes, out of Guelph. From Guelph? Yes. Yeah. Um, Brian Bridal it was, or something? Yeah, it was Byron something. Bridal? Yeah, yeah, I have his name here, but right. I, I'm trying to, well, he, trying to look Are you for talking it. about when he was, he said what they learned is that the, the jab, it's not staying in the area of the shoulder yes, muscle. Yes, exactly. The protein, in many cases, is actually going, getting into the bloodstream and yep. going all throughout the- people's bodies. So I think that is what the concern was. And also, and we have some clips to kind of play from some other doctors as well, that initially it wasn't thought that the spike protein could be a problem to people. And, and what is now emerging is that it actually has started to cause a problem. So it's a combination of two things. One, they didn't recognize the spike protein, which is the thing that is similar to with, with the virus that they figured would stimulate the immune system. They didn't recognize that that would be a problem for the system. And they also didn't recognize that it was supposed to it was developed in a way where it would just stay in the, in the immediate area, the shoulder muscle, and, and, and go down to the lymph nodes in that area and stimulate the immune system from there. But now, the spike proteins are in many cases flowing all throughout people's bodies. And they're finding the spike protein in alarming rates around like the ovaries and, you know, and, and this is, you know, this is where you're getting the blood clotting and all sorts of things are going on in the body. And as Dr. Stillman has said, it's like the adverse effects are varying so much because it's impacting people in, in different ways. That, that's what's emerging in conversations. Yeah. And I guess this is why the CDC is having this emergency meeting now, because it's things that they hadn't realized in the past that they're realizing now. You know, How, how is that all coming across in America now? Yeah. Great question. When you say coming across, do you mean kind of like how it's how it's coming out in the media? How is it coming out in the media, and what like what are the conversations that are happening in physicians in your circles around these topics? Well, you know, because I've voiced skepticism about 
the mainstream narrative, I'm now connected with and keeping company mostly with physicians in private practice who are skeptical of all this. I can't tell you what's going on in the doctor's lounge in the local hospital because a lot of them have just gone in for whatever they're being told. Uh, at least that's how it seems to me. And, and a lot of them are just hell bent on defending the status quo. And that's part of human nature. You know, we, we don't want to admit when we've been wrong. But what really has has convinced me that I'm right to be skeptical are the experts in academia and very well-respected medical institutions who have very long publication histories. They're very well-studied, well-researched, well-credentialed, uh, respectable scientists and physicians who've said, you know, there's something not right here. And they may all have different opinions on how you know, dangerous COVID is or what the risks and benefits of the vaccine are. And many of them are, are very clearly not anti-vaccine. They just don't agree with the way that the vaccine is being rolled out. And these are people like Peter McCulloch and people like uh, Dr. Pierre Corey, and people like Dr. Paul Merrick. And they don't all have a, 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 an open opinion on, on vaccination or immunity or whatever, but they all have some kind of issue with the way that things are being done and the way patients are being treated, or in many cases not treated with things like ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. Right. And this goes back to the way that you know, the frontline doctors uh, came out and then were censored aggressively in you know, July of, of last year. So basically what's happening in America is the people who are on the front lines, a lot of them are speaking up and saying what we're seeing that works is being marginalized, undermined by the authorities in favor of this experimental vaccine that has really been rushed to market and is now being pushed on everybody with a pulse. And when people who have a lot to lose, uh, people who are, because you know, I, I don't really have that much to lose by speaking out. I mean, sure, I worry about the authorities coming after my practice, coming after my medical license, you know, making trouble for me. And that's one reason why I've been quiet the last six months. Uh, I haven't really been that active as far as speaking out against lockdowns and things like that. I wanted to, to continue my practice and I wanted all this to go away. It's become clear that it's not just gonna go away we have to fight this. We have to say, look, this is wrong. Depriving people of their basic civil liberties, discriminating against them based upon their medical status. This is not appropriate. It's not right. It's not justified by what's really going on. So anyway, to answer your question, sometimes some independent doctors and doctors in, in academia are speaking out against this and saying, this isn't right. They're getting to the people through non-traditional media and sometimes through you know, traditional media like the radio with people like yourself who are willing to speak the truth and take a controversial uh, stance against, you know, what is the establishment narrative. Right. So in regards, because you, you started to talk about lockdowns, uh, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that and the effectiveness of it? Oh, my gosh. It's been the biggest <laughs> failure in the history of public health. I mean, the funny thing about this is the people who want you to believe in the lockdowns will cherry pick their data and they'll say, oh, well, we think this, that, and the other thing. And we think maybe if we do it enough, it'll work. Well, they have no actual data to back that up. And this would be like going into a patient saying, hey, listen, we have this thing. We think it's going to work to treat your disease. Um, there are a lot of downsides. It's going to cost you a lot of money. It may really severely impact your mental health. You may be totally miserable for doing it. And, you know, we're not really sure it's going to work. You know, would you sign up for a medical treatment like that? No, of course you wouldn't. You would say, you know what, thanks. I'm going to stay home, save my money, save my time. You find somebody else to try this out on, and you let me know how it works, and you come back once you've figured out all the details, and, and you can pitch me again, right? That's what the lockdowns have basically been. And when you all you got to do is look at the data between, like, North and South Dakota to see this. North Dakota, they had some mass mandates, and I may, be, I may have mixed these up, but, you know, basically you can look this up on your own and verify it for yourself. They had some mask mandates, they had some social distancing and so on and so forth. South Dakota, none of that. It was just business as usual through the whole pandemic. And you can look at the rates of infections and positive cases and hospitalizations, all this stuff, and they're exactly the same. And the other thing that people don't wanna talk about is all the confounding variables in this, right? Like a lot of the, this has really been a case-demic, not a pandemic. The number of positive cases, the number of deaths is related to the over-testing of the populace. I mean, anybody walking through, you know, like a, a pharmacy in the United States with a pulse 
can get a COVID-19 test. And many very smart, well-credentialed, well-studied doctors have looked at this PCR test being ju- that we're judging positive cases on them and said, this test is snake oil. This, does not, this is not a robust measure of whether or not someone has an active infection. So, but still, if you just look at the data on how the lockdowns have worked, whether or not they've reduced cases, they haven't. There's no compelling evidence of that. That meme that they're effective, that it's worth it, this virtue signaling, I'm doing it for other people, it's ridiculous. You know what I mean? I mean, it's about as scientific as, you know, getting out your Ouija board and saying, I guess, what vitamin do I need today? You know, it's absurd. And and also, you know, <laughs> you know, being that COVID-19 is being claimed as so deadly, when you're uh-huh. diagnosed with it, why do they just say, go home for two weeks? I mean, if it's so it's, deadly, shouldn't you be yeah. getting a treatment for it? Because that, that's what I would think. I mean, if I, if I test positive for COVID, why am I then being told, go home for two weeks? Shouldn't I be getting a treatment? Well, if we have a treatment for COVID-19, then we can't justify an emergency authorization for an experimental preventative measure. Right. I mean, I know that that uh, we had Dr. Dowling on last week, Dr. D, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, it was said that ivermectin has not been has not gone through the correct clinical trials. Don't quote me again. (laughs) Or it has not uh, been proven, you know, to work, uh, you know. But then again, um, neither has this jab. So how can you say the jab safe, but ivermectin that's been around for 40 plus years uh huh. Is not allowed, or you know, I know. The people are being given a hard time because it has shown that, it, based on some studies, that it does work. And again, you're listening to Dr. Stillman. He is based out in Florida. Um, if you could just give everybody your website as well, Dr. Stillman, in case yeah, people do want to reach out to you individually. Yeah, it's stillmanmd.com. Yeah, yeah. And to your point, you know, with ivermectin, everyone I know with a medical degree and the guts to use ivermectin in COVID is telling me that it works. I mean, we're talking about people in, I mean, this, the, the colleague I'm thinking of right off the top of my head is, is, is my colleague, Dr. Ruxan in Amavar, who's practiced, I'm a member of pretty healthy NYC. And she's treated dozens of people through the pandemic. I mean, dozens, lots of people. And it was written up in The Purist by Christina Cuomo. I find it particularly ironic that Christina yeah, wrote yeah. up this, yeah. you know, when CNN has been dumping on ivermectin this whole time. But I'm telling you, I mean, people using ivermectin swear by it. And could we all be wrong? Yeah. Wouldn't be the first time a lot of smart people are wrong. But if I'm wrong about ivermectin, I am in very good company. And, you know, like you said, shouldn't we have treatment for it? If all these people are saying it works, why hasn't there been more robust study of it? They're trying to stop us from doing what we think is right. And it's... It's very dystopian. And what do you think about uh, all the incentives? So just a couple of days ago, I don't. Mm-hmm. I didn't know whether to laugh, to cry, to throw my phone. Um, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know how to react to this. And it was basically in Las Vegas. Come get your jab. It only can be Johnson and Johnson or Pfizer. Again, mm-hmm. don't quote me. I think it was those two. Mm-hmm. Come get your jab. At this strip club, you'll get uh-huh. a dance, you'll get a free bottle, you'll get limo rides. It's a five thousand dollar platinum package. Like, wow. how is that a norm? That to me, that is just not a normal thinking process. Like, yeah. what is that? It's so weird. I, I agree. <laughs> you know, I mean, the thing about this is, if you carry this public health agenda to its logical conclusion, and your goal is to actually make the healthiest most robust, resilient population in the world, you don't actually start with vaccination. You start with simple things like exercise and green leafy vegetables and going to bed on time, right? You know, when are they going to have the SWAT team going door to door, breaking in doors of the people who are staying up and watching TV too late? You know, go to bed. It's time for you to, you know, turn in, stop eating those Cheetos, you know, put down the French fries, you know, no more hamburgers for you. Get on this treadmill. You know what I mean? Well, did it's you see the one with the go- with the which, which governor was it? It was a governor of New York, I think, um, yeah. where he was sat there. And again, I saw this last week. Uh-huh. It was the mayor. Sorry, uh, mayor. Yeah. Uh, he's sitting there eating a burger <laughs> and French fries, and says, "Oh, is it too early to be eating a burger and French fries?" 
just imagine this like a vaccine. Mm. I mean, it's it's just so that whole thing to, that just where you, you lose me there. You you just completely yeah. lose me. Um, anyways, uh, we actually have. Um, Oh, we did have a call. I think I think they've hung up. Um, again, if you have any questions, the hotline's 232-1033. But if you wouldn't mind um, touching on the, well, on, on your thoughts on travel restrictions, because as I'm, I'm not quite sure if you're aware, but uh, effective today uh, here in Bermuda, it was put off, I think, about five times uh, mm-hmm. where they said that, so they've put this off five times, but it's come into effect today that all unvaccinated travelers are being made to quarantine. And I don't even know if I can use luxury hotel. I mean, because uh, some of them are, some of them aren't. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, anyways, besides that, I'll get into more of that later. But um, they're basically telling people that when you come back home, you have to stay at this government facility for Mm -hmm. 14 days Mm -hmm. if you are unvaccinated and obviously it's a massive problem here now and and you actually have to pay for it yourself and this is what's crazy there's so many factors that go with that obviously the list can go on and on and on but listen to this an unvaccinated person tests negative negative. they have to stay in the quarantine a vaccinated person tests positive, but they can go home to quarantine. This is this is the rules. So obviously, the travel restrictions now that have just been put in place, Bermuda's most of Bermuda's up in arms, and understandably so. It's very very stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, right, and Not it's sad. Costly. I mean, my my heart was so heavy on Friday. I mean, heavy to where I I I was actually building myself up to to come on this show today because. My, I, I'm talking heavy, sad, stressed, just lost of words, lost hope, and just I was sat crying with my mom. You know, what do we do? And what's so sad is when this all started and the vaccine was going to be rolled out, it was very clear by the leaders of the country, the current government, that they would never mandate this vaccine. But isn't mm. that a form of mandating something, but kind of, as you would say, beating around the bush? Zara, yeah. you can't even get on the plane unless you've paid for the hotel. Yes. Sophia Kandinger just joined us. Welcome, Sophia. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and also, it's not really a hotel stay because you have to be, remain locked in your room the entire time yep. and your food is delivered on a schedule and the hallways will be monitored by security, paid security to make sure that no one leaves the room or interacts with anyone else for the entire time. And the room is not cleaned for two weeks. And, wow, and, and that's also, gross. We actually, we actually have, uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, in, in saying that, we actually have a call coming through right now. Uh, let me just take that really quickly. Uh, I think we lost him again. Go Hi, ahead. good morning. Oh, there we go. Good morning, Vibe 103. I just want to say thank you for this show. It's, it's definitely been like a support group for those of us that are on the same thinking process. But my question would be, has any data been shown uh, with regards to the vaccinated people with and health risk to unvaccinated people, like vaccine shedding? Okay. So, Dr. Stillman, the question is, has any data emerged that is showing that people who have taken the the jab have become a risk to people who haven't through this shedding? It's a great question. Data. Hmm. What kind of data would we even look for, right? Because how do you Uh, study this? Is it frustrating? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I find myself at a loss for how how to figure out how to judge these things. All I can tell you, the only data that I have, and this, I, I thought this was just, you know, no disrespect intended, but just women being crazy when I first heard it. Um, no, no, and I, I, I see where you're coming from. Don't worry. We were too. You know what I'm gonna, yeah. yeah, you know what I'm going to talk about. So I had multiple female patients contact me after it rolled out in the winter and tell me that they were having really excessive menstrual bleeding 
for sometimes weeks. And I remember one of them saying to me, look, I am like a clock. It's this many days, it's this much flow, yeah. and it's not painful. And I just had the, a two week period from hell that you know rocked my world and was very painful. And I don't quite know what to make of that. I Originally, like I said, I thought, oh, this is just a couple of my patients just being weird or they're stressed or I don't know. No, hundreds of women, maybe thousands, tens of thousands, I don't know, but lots of women wrote about this online, shared their stories, shared their experiences. Is that hard data? No. Is anyone getting me that data? No. Can I tell you it's harmful or dangerous to be around somebody who's had the jab? Of course I can. My bias, doing what I do and knowing what I know, is be the healthiest version of yourself that you can be, and you won't have to worry about what other people are doing, right? You know, you'll be able to deal with, you know, the little bit of secondhand smoke you're getting from their cigarette or their cigar down the beach. You'll be able to deal with, you know, whatever kind of weird energy they're putting off. You'll be able to deal with whatever kind of, um, you know, exosomes, which is what we're really talking about here when we talk about viruses, uh, they're, they're shedding. Um, and, you know, the last thing I want people to do is to live in fear, to isolate themselves. You know, if I had to say if there's one running theme in this whole thing on the agenda, it's to divide people. It's to get them to focus on things that make them different, not bring them together. It's to get them to focus on fabricated problems and not the real problems that are facing their societies, which are really the uh, epidemic of chronic diseases that, you know, make you more vulnerable to dying from COVID. Um, that are being created by corporations and governments working together to make really unhealthy habits and food cheap and to make you know healthy living and wholesome habits expensive and inaccessible. Go back 100 years, pretty much everyone ate a local seasonal diet. They fed and were fed by their neighbors. They had strong local communities. Today, people are eating fake food made, made by these big multinational corporations that have no interest in keeping you healthy. They're taking the money they're saving on production. They're, they're using it to buy ad space and toxic media and entertainment uh, outlets that are rotting your brain. They're keeping you up all night. They're addicting you to their, their, their streams, their, their media. And you know this is what's making people sick. And it's really simple. And the funny thing is, is that people can check out of and, and get out of this dystopian Orwellian system that's being engineered for them anytime they want, just by turning their cell phone off, walking down the street to a place that serves wholesome, natural, local food, you know, ordering a meal and sitting down and talking to other like-minded people about what's really important in life. Okay. Thank you. Again, if you have any questions for Dr. Stillman, it's 232-1033. I know we saw the lines going, so apologies that we, we missed you, obviously. I, I would hate to interrupt Dr. Stillman when he's giving such informative information. Um, you know, go ahead, Thanks. Eugene. Yeah, so Dr. Stillman, I know that Florida, and I know you were in originally practicing in Florida. You've just moved there recently. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, and by the way, Dr. Stillman has done recording an episode on Beyond the Pandemic, so his episode will be upcoming. That's how I've gotten to know him, so, um, and, and, and it's great. It's really, as he's doing today, he shared a lot of great insight. But I just wanted to ask about Florida, because Florida, I think, was first out of the gates to say, okay, all these emergency measures, mm -hmm. like, that's it. Actually, we're reversing it. You know, we're not trying to coerce people into taking the jab. We're actually saying that if we find that you're trying to coerce people or any employers, we're going to fine you for doing that. If you even, you know, make it seem like it's mandatory, it's an issue. So what is it like in Florida? Like Florida opened up, you know, are, are there any problems emerging? Are the hospitals overloaded? Are you... No. pressured with people yeah, like is there, a, is there any material difference since they've opened up not at all you know and, and people need should know that i i was a traveling doctor for the vast majority of 2020 i worked in two different hospitals in two different states i worked in multiple outpatient clinics saw thousands of patients and the simple fact is that when you look at the morbidity the mortality the hospitalization rates it wasn't that different from a typical year there were places and there were times 
where it was significantly different, where there was more morbidity, where there was more mortality. Those places were all urban areas where people are particularly inundated with fake light, fake food, fake news, living these very high stress, um, unnatural lifestyles. And, you know, so it's no wonder to me why there was more morbidity and mortality there. They were set up to fail. And when you look at uh, the data from the United States, when you look based on, on um, latitude, right, uh, the more northerly states had worse outcomes with a few exceptions. The few exceptions were places like Mississippi and Louisiana that had pretty high um, mortality. Why is that? Because those states are very impoverished and they have a very large proportion of people who are who are eating really unhealthy food that they're buying with food stamps that they get from their government, which, you know, apparently wants them to be super healthy. And that's why they're providing them with you know free medical care. So anyway, the point is, you know, in Florida, there was no there's nothing to this premise that, you know, it was wrong for them to open up, that it was wrong for them to stop these uh, uh, precautionary measures, that it was wrong for the governor to ensure people's rights and freedoms. The governor was right on. There was no good reason to shut things down. You know, a lot of a lot of businesses ended up catering to people from out of state who were afraid and people in the state who were afraid and doing things like, you know, mandating masks and whatever. But there was no, there's no tangible epidemiological benefit to that in Florida based on what we've seen. Mm. Thank you very much. We yeah. actually have a call. Vibe 103, good morning. Hi, good morning to everyone. And uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing that you guys have this show where people can be informed and get more information about how to look and deal with this um, um, time in the world right now when it comes to this pandemic. What I'd like to say is, um, just and listen to people telling for the last 50 a month, that what replaces common sense and knowledge is fear. And I just would like to uh, put up to the people this year's show, to use your common sense and not let fear get in the way of you just being thinkers and readers and understanders. Um, I look at uh, a year ago, um, Mark Bina came out and spoke about mass, not wearing masks and having fresh and eating healthy, and he got berated by 90% of, of the people that, that had heard his comment um, about just fresh air and eating decent and stuff. And now, here we are now. Where now, that's all people want to do, and people couldn't wait to get their mask off, take their mask off. So, again, people, don't let fear get in the way of your common sense. You exercise, you take care of yourself. And what's even more was disturbing to me was that when we were on the lockdown, we said everybody put on weight, people just eating, 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 shopping massively, eating massively. And it was never any, uh, um, nothing came from the health organization or certainly from the health minister about your diet. What are you eating? In this? Because you know if you're locked on, you can eat more and different things like that. And information is key. and You can't, just can't give out the wrong information or not give out the right information. And I think that it's got to be a balance with dealing with this pandemic and then common sense of how you can eat and take care of yourself. Now, when it comes to ivermectin, I was talking about ivermectin a year ago. So um, I had done a lot of research on it, read a lot. Matter of fact, I had sent, I had got some stuff sent to Kyron Brown. I actually spoke to the doctor who worked at his office about ivermectin. So I had been on to that. And if we are serious about protecting people, by any means necessary, but they're just use the means that are available to us, and ivermectin is one of them. And I think that. Um, Families and physicians and politicians, we have to have this discussion. If we certainly talk about saving lives and not just putting fear in people, um, fear is, 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 is a sickness that even after this pandemic is going, people will now have to deal with the fear that caused them not to be thinkers and not to get totally the right thing to take care of themselves. If what I'm saying is making sense, I hope that, or oh, I'm hoping you can make sense of what I'm saying. Um, but I think, again, let's try to remove fear and be thinkers, not be consumed of all this negative stuff, negative stuff when it comes to COVID and when it comes to vaccines and, and stuff like that. Just common sense, people. Come on, we've been taking us care of ourselves for thousands of years. Our grandmothers and, and mothers have we've been taking care of ourselves. We've been taking care of ourselves when it comes to flus and ailments and different things we're here. So we can't abandon what we've been taught or what's been passed on to us out of fear. That's all I like to say. 
Thank you, caller, so much. Enjoy your day. All right. So, yeah, Dr. Stillman, I mean, that caller was just asking a lot about fear and stuff. So we have another caller coming in. We can, we can go ahead to the lines again, yeah. 5103, good morning. Yes, good morning. I'm just calling in reference to um, someone that had COVID, and they told him to stay in for two weeks. If, if you don't mind, just, just to turn your radio on just a little bit for me, please. Okay, they was told to... Is that okay? Yes, thank you. They was told to stay in for two weeks or the 14 days. And before the week was up, they took ill. They got worse, I should say. And for those two, two weeks, nothing was told what to do or what to take. They couldn't go to the GP. So by then, before the week is up, they were in the hospital. And this person suffered from asthma. So with no time, they were sent to ICU and succumbed to their death, succumbed. I'm just not understanding this government. You know, 14 days, you stay home until something gets worse, and, and no one can tell you what to do, what to take. I'm not understanding this. And on top of that, you know... Um, Gosh, I'm just so lost for words. I'm overwhelmed right now. Just can't. I just can't That's okay. That's okay. understand how how this can be done. And then they tell you. I think the person said they told them the health department will contact you the next day. No one ever contacted them. And that's all I I, I have to say. And I, I'm just wondering what can the gentleman speak about on this. Thank you, caller, and again, condolences. Yeah, that's a difficult situation, I know. Personally, I've <clears throat> encountered people who have had similar experiences and have lost family members, and, and they have, like, so many questions about the process. Um, and although they're being put on as a, as a COVID death, um, the way the situation is handled appears to have contributed so much to the outcome, you know? Um, and, and they were just struggling for answers, you know, just to kind of understand. And, and that's where the doctors that we've been speaking with are saying is like, like this has never happened in history. Like we, we treat people. That's what we're trained to do is to treat people. You know, like Dr. Darlin said, we actually have credentials behind our names. Like, we're supposed to use our wealth of knowledge and experience to find solutions for people. And this is a situation where we're being asked to kind of back off. So, I don't know, Dr. Stillman, what what are you, your thoughts on all of that? I mean, I completely agree with Dr. Dowlin. And the, the history of medicine is full of examples where, you know, the people who were just on the front line, so to speak, doing the work, taking care of the patients, putting in the hours, came up with brilliant, brilliant new treatments and therapies, and were often shut down by the people in charge because they their new paradigm was a threat to the old paradigm, and you know, or a threat to a to a vested interest, right? And it's it's scary to read those stories harrowing to think about how flawed human nature really is. And that's why, you know, in the Western world, we, we value freedom so much because our history is just full of examples of when people gave up their freedoms, somebody came into power who abused that power and took advantage of those populations. And that's exactly what's happening here. I mean, people in charge are taking advantage of powers that they have in many cases seized unlawfully in this country, unconstitutionally, and what are they doing with them? Are they actually acting in the best interests of the people? Are they actually doing what's going to serve the communities? They think that they're going to serve the communities. They think that what they're doing is right. But you look at the actual data, that's not clear at all. And you know, for better or for worse, logical, intelligent people differ in their opinions. And you know, when you put one of those people, you know, 
over other people. You create a system of, of you know, authori- an authoritarian system. And when you do that in medicine, you prevent doctors from innovating and coming up with good solutions. And that is why it's so important um, for us to remain free because the best ideas come from the people who are actually taking care of the patients. Thank you. I think we actually have another call. 5103 FM, good morning. Hello, good morning. Hello? Hello, good morning. 5103, you're on air. Oh, uh, we lost him. Lost him. Yeah, yeah, it looked like they were driving, so they probably had a had a poor signal and stuff like that. But All right, um, I don't know, should we just... Uh, uh, Sophia actually has a question for Dr. Stillman, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Dr. Stillman, we're going to keep you for a few more minutes, and then we can just close it out. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Stillman. Good morning, Bermuda. Um, so what do we want from all of this? We, we as, you, as Eugene has said, the, the problems are coming forward. Uh, the, the adverse effects are, are coming to the fore. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are, are in, effect, in effect, waking up. Um, people have been hurt. People have taken the jab and are feeling resent, resentment. Um, mm-hmm. And they have been coerced in, in many cases to take it. So are we asking for redemption here? Are we asking for, um, for, for people to be punished for the wrongs that they've done to others? Yeah. Or are we trying to just send them love and embrace the entire community and say, look, whether you've had the jab or whether you haven't, if you're having adverse effects or you're not, let's come together. We are all discovering the truth here and let's love each other and help each other, help the people who have taken the jab, help them with their, with their, um, help them discover how they can be better taking care of themselves because they're coming forward and asking for help. Uh, help the people who are not sure, who, who are not sure whether they want to take the jab or not. Um, give them, with this is what we're doing right now, give them more information. But we're also, I think, saying to the people who have put this um, situation in play that we forgive you now and we, under- we understand what you're up to and we're giving you time to apologize to us as human beings for the wrongs that you've done. And we'll, we'll move on as a, human, as a human race, but we need you to apologize to us for the wrongs that you've done. We're still gonna love each other and love overcomes fear. Um, if, if enough of us uh, zone in together and love and meditate and and think positive thoughts, all of this will go, but we need an apology for the wrongs that have been done to us. I think what we need first is transparency. We need to actually know what's happened. We need to know how it happened. And that's what we don't have. A lot of the skepticism around all of this has arisen only because people had incomplete data But when they looked at that incomplete data, they said, this data doesn't make any sense. I remember seeing cases where, you know, in Florida, there were there were uh, uh, public health departments where every single COVID test was positive. Hmm. How does that make any sense? What kind of test is positive all of the time? Okay, and then on top of that, you know, this these these vaccine trials, the way that they were done, were they actually transparent? I don't feel that they were transparent. Who collected the data? Who curated the data? Who got to have access to the data? How is the data safeguarded from one point to another point? When you, for example, are, are taking a, a drug test as part of an employment uh, physical or screening or as a monitoring program, if you're on parole and they're, they're making sure you're not using drugs, you know, do they trust you to collect your own urine at home and then bring it into the office? Of course not. They have you pee in a cup in a room that's got a toilet that's literally been disabled so that you cannot you know, do anything untoward to it. They pat you down, they make sure you're not bringing in somebody else's urine. There are safeguards here, right? The pharmaceutical industry has a long history of abusing the public trust. And frankly, no one in the pharmaceutical industry has been adequately punished to really incentivize them not, or I should say disincentivize them from doing that again. The same thing's happening in in the government with politicians and unelected bureaucrats just doing what they think is 
or really what they want to, and then not facing any punishments for this. And Dr. Fauci is like classic case of this. The guy is an extremely overpaid public servant, right? And I find it just nauseating the way that, uh, that our government officials are being paid during this pandemic where everyday people have been laid off. You know, I mean, it's just, it reminds me of, you know, what Mary Antoinette said shortly before she was beheaded. She said, let them eat cake, right? That's what it looks like when Fauci makes, you know, 400 something thousand dollars a year. And so many Americans have been put out of work, have been impoverished by this pandemic, family businesses that have been open for decades, just gutted and destroyed by it. I'm sure the same thing's happening in Bermuda. Yeah. And that's what we need. We need transparency. We need to know what happened. We need to know why it happened. That's why the Fauci email leaks were so um, impactful, so important. You know, we need to know what these people are actually doing in order to understand why they're doing it so that we can then decide, well, what is the appropriate, you know, uh, justice for those who have been harmed um, by this totalitarian agenda? (laughs) Thank you, Dr. Stillman. Yeah, what Again, a closing. if you're just yeah, if you're again if you're just <laughs> tuning in, you can actually it's Dr. Stillman. Um, he actually has his practice in Florida, and he was kind enough to give us his time today. Uh, well, I didn't even anticipate to talk this long, but it was great. I'm sure our listeners actually really appreciate it, and we appreciate you. Um, if you have any questions or you do want to reach out to Dr. Stillman directly, it's stillmanmd.com. That's S T I L L M as in mother, A as in animal, N as in Nancy md.com uh, and on the other side we're going to have uh, Mark Pettingill giving us an update on the court case here in Bermuda again thank you Dr. Stillman thank you for having me <laughs> you can't separate peace from freedom because no one can be at peace unless he has freedom Malcolm X The Constituents 441, Bermuda Constitution Order 1968. Protection of freedom of movement, except with his consent. No person shall be hindered in the enjoyment of his freedom of movement. That is to say, the right to move freely throughout Bermuda. The right to reside in any part thereof. The right to enter Bermuda and immunity from expulsion therefrom. Bermudian should not have to pay detention fees to return home. All persons entering Bermuda are a potential risk and should be threatened equally. Chancery Legal and 25 Bedford Row, led by Courtney Griffiths QC and Mark Pettengill, who are assisted by Aaron Hill, have been instructed by a group of concerned Bermudians, Constitutional Freedom Bermuda, to mount a constitutional challenge against the government's existing and impending COVID-19 regulations. The group is committed to representing our clients without fear or favor and irrespective of political affiliation. The group holds the view that the regulations, particularly those that discriminate between the vaccinated and unvaccinated have gone a step too far. To find out more about the case and to assist in the efforts, go to Constitutional Freedom Bermuda on Instagram. And if you're desirous of supporting the cause, click the link on the group's Instagram page for access to the Crowd Justice page. The group is immensely grateful for the support received thus far and looks forward to fully ventilating their case in the Bermuda courts. Visit Constitutional Freedom Bermuda on Instagram today. Tell you don't f*** around with my family yeah. Don't get it twisted, police them, not your friend them Only working for the twisted agenda More we the people recommend And then the governor step in and come and twist the agenda Burn out the wicked and bad mind people who Only want to see us stumble Oh Lord, God help you, let me spot a evil and protect all the meek and the humble. You mess with me family, post you, cross the line, I'm gonna make it my vendetta, go find you. Don't f*** with me family, the whipping car seats I'm blind, and you're gonna know when certain people surround you. Hey. you cause you don't want me as your enemy, trust me. 
crash your enemy. Hola. Who are gonna stop them? Them on them power tripping. Boat conference bullshit. Baga lipping. You can't fool me. Wait till people start flipping. I know the cool it. When we drink, no one sipping. Me split me family. Post you. Cross the line. I'm no gonna make it my vendetta. Go find you. No. With me family, they think car seats I'm blind, and you're gonna know when certain people surround you. You, cause you don't want me as your enemy. Trust me. You don't want me as your enemy. Alright, no problem. Good morning, Vibe 103. Good morning, Hello. Vibe 103. Hi, Mark. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm We're well, thank you. Good, we're live on air, and obviously, uh, all of our listeners are probably anticipating an update from you, so if you can just go right, at, go right in, that'd be great. Yeah, first of all, let me just say a happy Father's Day to all the fathers vaccinated and unvaccinated. Um, <laughs> I hope they have a, I hope they have a great day. Um, that's, a I, uh, no. that's a category. No, we have to, you know, we have to consider that. Like we need something else to think about, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you, it, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, you know, human beings always find a way to uh, discriminate, like throughout history, whether it's religion, whether it's race, you know, whether it's sex, uh, whether it's sexual gender, somehow, some way, you know, when we when we put one thing to uh, to rest, or we deal with one thing, we'll find another way, right? And so this is like this is the latest one we've come up with. I think. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I have to say I really enjoy listening to Dr. Stillman, and what's important about that, and I say this from a legal perspective, is you know it's not so much what what you know he is in endeavoring to push on people; he's asking the right questions, and people have to question. And do research, and far too often, you know, we behave like we behave like sheep, and we're just prepared to say, you know, your government is is telling you this, and this is uh, this is what we are going to do, you know, and it, it's those questions were absolutely imperative that that people uh, ask those types of questions and do that type of research for themselves, because words like totalitarian and dystopian are are what is going on here. And, you know, people need to be aware of it. So thank, uh, thank the Lord for, you know, your radio show and for what you guys are all doing and what we're endeavoring to do. Um, on, the, on the aspect of the legal thing, of course, somehow, and I'm still not sure of the process of this yet, the, the new quarantine regs have, have gone up. I think, Zara, you put it brilliantly when you said, and people just need to look at this, vaccinated and unvaccinated, all right? No matter how strongly you believe one way or the other. Right. Look at the absolute incredulous nonsense of the fact that you land and test uh, negative as an unvaccinated person, and you have to go into a health hotel room at your expense for two weeks, potentially with your minor children, not having it cleaned, right? Having your meal served and being under a security watch, and that's okay, and. Because, and the vaccinated person who tests positive gets to go home. I mean, let's just pause there for a second and ask ourselves, whichever side of the divide that you come down on, on the diversity that has been created by the rhetoric that has gone on, how commonsensical you think that is. And, and more importantly, show me the science, show me the empirical evidence that supports that approach. That's what the court case coming up is going to be about. Show me that evidence, you know, from a doctor that's saying this is supported by evidence, that approach is supported by evidence. I, I, don't, I don't believe that that is there, and that is the thing that we intend to press on. I think we're gathering very good information um, from doctors like Dr. Stillman. It's amazing how people are afraid to come forward. I get dozens, dozens of contacts now a day by email, by phone calls, of people giving me information. And, and some of these people are legitimately afraid to speak out, to file an affidavit. And I've had people like actuaries call me, other doctors that have called me, people that have suffered through certain side effects 
from the vaccine are afraid to go public because of what repercussions they may suffer, either from you know their professional colleagues calling them cracks, or from you know their their concern, their fears about will they if they're non bermudian will there be you know immigration repercussions, or even if they are, will they be ostracized? It is a very very frightening and unsettling time, and that is real. But I need to share, Zara, with your listeners one legal issue because we, we basically started another legal case this weekend, which has now, I think, gone to rest because I had a client that contacted me who, in accordance with the government guidelines, is not vaccinated and got a medical certificate. In the words of what the government requires to say that they were medically vulnerable the physician certified that they were medically vulnerable and should not be quarantined. Now, be ready for this. That was from a medical practitioner. They sent everything in what they were supposed to do. They got a reply from a government email whose address was noreply.gov.bm. You can't make this stuff up. This is real. They got a reply from an email saying noreply.gov.bm. And it said, in relation to their medical certificate and their application, and I'm reading it now, your application for an exemption from the quarantine hotel has been denied. In big, bold, black capital letters. That was it. Now, I won't get into all of the legal ramifications of how unlawful, unconstitutional, (laughs) invalid, as far as government process goes and the duties of a minister to give reasons and so on and so forth, let's just park that for a second. Because common sense people can just see that. So they did what the government said was required for an exemption through a medical practitioner with a certificate and got that type of refusal. Now, we went into immediate action, basically saying we'll see you in court on Tuesday on what's called judicial review. And emails were sent and so on, and we immediately began to put that case together in short order. Today, they got another note in, again, from noreply.gov.bm that said, your application for an an exemption has been granted. That was the extent of the dialogue. Now, for 24, 36 hours, they went through the nightmare of thinking, I've done everything I'm supposed to do, and I've gotten this very chart, you're denied. And I suddenly had this real fear about, oh my God, they're not even going to comply with normal legally required standards in relation to their own legal amendments that I still have issues with as to how they put it through and what's required. And I think, you know, are they thinking that you're going to have to produce more medical evidence? Because you're not. I mean, this is what a doctor has said in relation to this person. There are people that are legitimately suffering. They might have mental illness. They might have depression. That simply cannot. Your average average person, in my view, uh, couldn't tolerate two weeks of that type of enforcement. So this is the type of thing that we have going on, and these things need to be legally challenged if they're going to happen, and the government needs to do a whole revisit on this. For a government that has done a reasonably good job across the board and is taking this approach now, uh, they've lost the plot. So anyway, I hope that helps, Zara. I hope that you know people are are absolutely you know gobsmacked with regard to that information, which is all factual, um, with regard to what has uh, the latest has been. But we are pressing on with the unconstitutionality of um, what the uh, what the position is with regard to even separating a class of people between vaccinated and unvaccinated. Other countries in the world are simply not doing that. Um, everybody uh, may be quarantined for a few days in places like Canada or in the, UK, uh, in the UK if you come from red zones because of the fact that they know the science indicates that vaccinated people can still get it, can still carry it, and still pass it on. Uh, so it makes eminent sense that everybody in some form should be quarantined. And there is nothing scientific at all that says there should be a distinction between you quarantining at home and you being forced to stay in a hotel. It's just a mechanism in many people's view to uh, push people to uh, get the uh, get the vaccine. You've got the carrot of, here, you can have this price, you can do this. In Vegas, like you say, you can go to a strip club. In Virginia, you get a free gun if you fall into a certain lottery. They're doing that for Father's Day today, by the way. 
they're giving away like 10 free guns, just what America needs, right? If you go and get a, a vaccine and you, you, know, you win the prize. And then what we have in Bermuda is the stick. Uh, the stick is, if you don't get vaccinated, then this is what we're going to do to you. Um, it is a really upsetting um, and troubling time. Yeah, for, for, for everyone, Mark. And, yeah. and Mark, I'll, I'll say this, that, um, you know, my limited understanding of, of legal matters is that precedence plays a major role in it. So Absolutely. I just want to share this with you. Um, there has been a precedent set. Recently, um, someone traveled in and came through the airport and um, and they had done this previously unsuccessfully. They showed their antibody tests. Um, they actually had a few antibody tests because they have already recovered from COVID previously, you know, and their first yeah. antibody test um, showed that they clearly had the antibodies and things. And then the next one actually showed that it was even more robust, you know. Right. So anyway, um, just to let everyone know that the person was actually able to get through the airport um, and go home um, and they were treated in the same way that persons who are vaccinated have been treated. So we do have a precedence where someone's been able to come through the airport and use antibodies, you know, because everybody knows that natural immunity is robust. And yes, we know what the, that the narrative has been out there that is questionable. We don't know how long it lasts and things of that nature. But I'm just letting you know that there has been a precedence already. So if that can help you, in any well, way, I, I tell you, hundred percent that could help. I'd be really, we'd be really uh, obliged to hear from that person. I'm sure if you got that information, Eugene, it is a fact. But as you know, as far as the precedent goes, you have to set that out. As, as far as the court case goes, it's interesting because the next point I was going to raise is I know somebody very close to me who is a younger person who has been in the UK. He was a student who wishes to return. Who has exactly the same scenario, right? Uh, had COVID, has recovered and still has gone about trying to get the vaccine and was unable to do it in the UK. And, and like, you know, is trying to come home now, and then the second test date, they could, uh, the second vaccine date they could get in the UK was not until, like, August. They made inquiry, um, and they were told, yeah, they're still going to have to uh, quarantine, but we'll pay for it. I mean, can you imagine? There's a kid who's trying to do everything she can, can't get vaccinated, has had COVID, recovered, has the antibody. And here's the point. Where's the legal regulation and category that covers that? Because as you're saying, it, it, to me, that's a sensible precedent. But I can tell you right now on the face of it, none of those regs are covering that situation. None of them. And frankly, that means that somebody has exercised the discretion, I think, quite sensibly to let that person go home. But it's not covered by the regs. And there are a whole bunch of other types of scenarios that are not covered by those regs, but that's a glaring example of one that just isn't contained in any legal type of precedent by these regulations, and it should be. Um, and this is just, is, you know, just reflects where uh, it has not been well uh, or completely thought out. You know, it's just a way uh, to say, like, right, we're going to divide uh, these two uh, classes of people. You have that person come in coughing and sneezing, vaccinated, test positive for COVID, and, oh, yeah, go home, you know, take two hours for it and call us in the morning. Oh, you're fine. You're healthy. Uh, you're not vaccinated. Yeah, yeah, take your kids and go get locked up for two weeks. Come on. You know, like, just let's just be, uh, you know, sensible about how we're looking at this. Please, Bermuda. <sighs> Yeah, as a, we're yeah. sitting here kind of like Yeah, it's amazing you're that this is right? Yeah, yeah, it's you're amazing up. that this you're is up. even in that's even happening. But what I say this I say this, Mark, I said this at the beginning. The tide is rising. Oh yeah, yeah. More people are emerging, voices are being heard, and those who were stigmatized initially, right, are now their their respect and credibility is growing while major authorities all around the world are losing credibility by the day. You know, um, so, yeah, there definitely has been a shift. Um, the truth is coming to the surface, and, and that's all everyone's looking for. And at the end of the day, all through history, right, we've yet to have an experience where discrimination has led to a positive outcome. 
and this situation yeah. will be no different you know yeah. so um so this is something that the community is starting to rally around um so there's been a lot of coming together within the voices in the community and now that is spreading out and and you're even hearing people in other areas you know and and when that all comes together then yeah. that's when we're ultimately at our strongest. So, so thank you for the work that you're doing, for your team, the efforts you've made to represent the concerns in the community. We need everyone doing all that they can to work for this so that we can do what's best for Bermuda and his people. Thank you so much, yeah. Mark. We actually have some calls well, coming in. We'll, we'll be happy yeah. to take those. Have a really good Happy Father's Day, and thank you again so much for your time. Appreciate you guys. All love. God bless. All right. Peace and love. Vibe 103 FM. Hey, good morning. You know what? This is such a brilliant uh, program and such a brilliant conversation today. I really, really just have to say that. And everyone in Bermuda uh, should really hear this. So I know it's going to be posted later on for people who couldn't attend live, right? Yes, yes, definitely. So, um, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. <laughs> yes. And all the father figures. Now, my question to Mr. Pettingale is this. If Bermuda recognizes its obligation to provide free vaccination and if it recognizes an obligation to provide free COVID testing and lots and lots of uh, expensive advertising promoting the vaccine and promoting uh, safe measures uh, to protect against COVID, what is the government's obligation uh, to protect the constitutional freedom of its citizens in the respect that if indeed it's important for public health that persons who are not, uh, are not inoculated should be quarantined, why is it not the government's obligation to provide that quarantine? So in the interest of fair representation of all of its citizens, whether they are inoculated or not inoculated, whether they are healthy or whether they are unhealthy, doesn't the same obligation exist? And, and in that vein, how would this whole scenario look different if government were footing the bill for that 14-day quarantine? Uh, uh, would we have those same obligations of Bermuda's uh, best and most expensive and finest hotel. So that's just one of the things on my mind that I wanted to get off my chest today. Does not doesn't government have the obligation to uh, 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 unequi to equivocally provide protection and safety, not just for the health of their citizens, but also guarding their constitutional freedom to come and go within their own country. Mm. Okay, very good question. Thank you so good much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye everybody. Have a great. Day. Good morning, Vibe 103. I think we lost him. We're actually just trying to get Mark back on the line now. Um, but then again, for those who are listening, you can call 232-1033. Um, and we're just, we're just basically touching on, obviously, the quarantine facilities that have been put in place today. Um, and I know, uh, I think we might have him. Vibe 103. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Yes, go ahead. Your, your, your listeners are listening. Okay, I'm afraid I unfortunately kind of juggle back with the forward. I may have missed part of that lady's question, but I know that it's related to the constitutional issues and the, and the payment, um, you know, that's being required. Of course, the whole of the case is on the basis that in order for a government to be able to do this, the Constitution says, you know, it's what is reasonably required. That's the test. So she's hit the nail on the head in part of it by, you know, asking that question, because is it really reasonably required that people should pay for this? I mean, that's, you know, that, that, that is the first thing that we, uh, that, that we have to query is how can that be reasonably required? But even more so than that, how can it be demonstrated and reasonably required that people should be in forced quarantine in the first place when they can quarantine at home and they can be checked on as they have, you know, as, as is going on? and that that can be put into place. That is a reasonable approach for everybody. You know, the great washed and unwashed, vaccinated and unvaccinated. So that's exactly what it's about. It's about those constitutional rights and what's reasonably required. Now, I don't know if I missed part of it. If you can repeat anything for me, I can address that. 
Uh, I think that I yeah, think that actually it. covers it. Yeah, give I, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I did have a question though, Mark. Come in. Um, yeah. uh, public public figures asking about sovereignty in Bermuda and how one can go about attaining it. Not sure what that question is relating to. On on say again. Sorry. Uh, the question is sovereignty in Bermuda and how well, one can go about attaining it. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really sure how to to answer that, or even the the application there. I have to think on that one. Sorry. No, nope, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Don't don't pretend to know every single. <laughs> every single yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey. Oh, no, it's a it's yeah. a but thing though, the Mark. Then, then yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's it's a thing though because people are saying, okay, we understand that I live here, or I'm residing here, and there are laws of the country and things of that nature. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, I'm responsible for myself. Yeah. I'm, I'm responsible for my body, you know? Yeah. Um, so if I am in a situation where I feel like my health and well-being as a human is being threatened, then, you know, what powers do I have to exercise that right? You know, and okay. that's, that's like a genuine yeah. question right. that's coming out of the community because people are yeah. literally feeling forced and being coerced into making yeah. decisions that are, are not necessarily in their interest. Well, they, they are being coerced, and they're quite right to that. But all of these things, and, you know, it's not just life, it is, is law as well, particularly. You know, we have the scales of justice, and, and that is about balance. And all of this is about balance, and it's never going to be, you know, one extreme to the other. And, and I'm like, I'm not even an anti-vaxxer or an anti-experimental vaxxer, right? That's not the question at all. I just think that there have to be sensible lines that, that are drawn and looked at, and that's what, you know, laws and societies, if we choose to live together, then we have to have, you know, balance within that. And what is happening right now, you know, in my assessment and my view and that of many other people, is that this is not balance when it comes to a forced quarantine that you have to, to, uh, to pay for. It is not in line with what other places are doing. And on those circumstances, people should look at, well, well hold on, what is my legal right here? So particularly always go to the Constitution first. Because the Constitution gives you your rights, and it umbrellas all other laws. Now, I think that, you know, the, the government is trying to find a way uh, to uh, get, get through this um, and, you know, and, and, and weave about it. But even with regards to, I mean, the Quarantine Act got raised the other day. I think the Quarantine Act has provisions there for emergency measures. For instance, if you have somebody that lands and they appear to be really, really sick, and they're suffering from a disease, then you can detain them. If you have somebody that, that comes in, and this is under the quarantine act in my view, and, and you say, like, where have you been? And you say, I've been working at a treatment camp in Rwanda on the Ebola virus, you know, which was a really scary thing a few years ago. That person, you could say, well, hold on, we, we've got to detain you. We've got to isolate you and, and have a look at you. So it has to be based on evidence of, of illness, if you will. You know, somebody lands and they appear to be sick, and they've been exposed to COVID, yeah, maybe reasonable to detain them. But to think that you can make this application of quarantining on the basis that you're vaccinated or unvaccinated on, on a, a vaccine that does not stop fully uh, catching or spreading the disease is, again, this is the key word, is not reasonable and is not reasonably required. So I hope that maybe addresses the way that you have put it there very succinctly, Eugene, is that's what people have to look at with regard to what their rights are. People are just, some people are just afraid. I mean, you know, the evidence is not compelling to them uh, that they should get vaccinated. It's like what Stephen Cow was saying last week. You live a healthy lifestyle. If you do all of these things, like, you know, people that are healthy and so on and so forth are able to, you know, have an immune system that, that doesn't cause that. So a doctor said to me the other day, we're far better off spending our money on preventive measures, on encouraging people to get healthy, on eating healthy food, on laying on the ground on the grass once a day, you know, for 15 minutes, you know, in, in pushing these types of things forward instead of like saying, here, you know, here's the magic pill and that'll fix it. And, and people have the right to say no to that, right? And, but again, it's about the balance. And people, have a, and people have a right to travel. People have a right to travel, you know, again, with the balance. You know, it's not a privilege, it's a right. And, and sure as hell, it's a right to come home. 
you know, the idea that you have to get stopped at the airport in New York to prove that you paid for it, because that was what was propagated, remember? Mm -hmm. That seems to have gone by the way. But it was like you had to show that you paid for it, or you couldn't come back to your own country, Bermuda? I mean, where have we gone? Sophia actually, Sophia actually, yeah, Sophia actually has a question for you, Mark. Good morning. Sure. Just tagging on Hi, that. Okay. Hello, Mark. Or comment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm planning on traveling, and yeah. can British Airways, when you arrive at the airport, can they actually say, I'm sorry, you don't have a TA form, um, and they can they say they're not going to let the family on the flight? Is yeah, that I, I, I think they can, but that's kind of, now, whether I think that's right or lawful or constitutional, I don't, but can they do it? Sure. But then your issue becomes with, you know, British Airways, right? Not with, you know, so much the, the, the well, we know what's going on in talks between them and the government, but I think that the ability for them to do that is, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a private airline or, it's a, you know, the, whatever, it's a government-run airline in the, in the UK, but they can refuse anybody getting on the plane, and that then becomes an issue of, are you going to take a court action on that? But there's nothing to stop them. This is the problem with power, right? You know, when we say power corrupts. The problem with power is, and it's much like that reaction you're sending along saying, your application for an exemption is denied. You know, my, my immediate reaction to that was, you can't do that. Right. But they did. But they did. They tried it on. They tried it on. Right. So and where the trouble is that many people aren't going to think, let me pick up the phone and call Mark Pettingill or call whatever lawyer, and I'm going to sue you. You know, those things are processes that involve time and energy and, like, you know, an expense sometimes. You know, we're not all doing things for free for people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so not everybody has the access or the wherewithal to do that. So what happens is, unlike you, Sophia, and other people, and you, Zara, and you, Eugene, or me, you know, and, 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 and my wife and so on, who will just stand there and say, hold on a second, you can't do that. Many, many people will just succumb and say, oh, okay, and will follow along. They don't have that fight in them. And that's where it's really sad. That's why we have to be the voices for the people that are, are justifiably afraid not to give voice to their rights. And ju just quickly to bounce off of that, um, someone did have an experience, Mark, and this is where maybe we need some cl transparency or even clarity. Um, they tried to board a flight and they did not have the correct TA form based on what the agent had told them. The yeah. agent then said, step aside, you are not allowed to board. Um, yeah. Long story short, there was a button that had to be pushed um, within that TA form to upload the correct form. Um, but in the midst of it all, the person that worked for that airline informed the passenger that is from Bermuda. The reason why we were not allowed or were not going to be allowed to let you board this flight is because we have been informed by your government in Bermuda, if we allow you to board this flight without the correct TA form, your government will fine our airline $5,000 per passenger. So that's where it gets very confusing and we need transparency on that because if I did hear you correctly, you said the airline can then, they can deny you, but is it the airline that's, at, that's implementing this or is it the Bermuda government that's implementing these things and making it difficult for the airline? So then it came to a point where the passenger then said, well, at the end of the day, if you're not going to allow me board this flight, well, then you're just going to deport me home. So it's like, it's kind of like, where is, again, where is the transparency? Is it the Bermuda government? Is that true? I mean, why would the airline make that up to the passenger and say, look, we can't let you board because your Bermuda government has told us if we allow you to board this flight, we will be fined $5,000 per passenger. Well, I, I mean, I'd, I'd very much like to know and see that. I, I haven't heard of seeing that. You know what I'm like with evidence? Uh, well, like, I can definitely, know, definitely I, say it's 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 100, and I will put it on my kid's life. It's a thousand trillion percent. I know this person that had this experience. No, and no, I mean, they it, may yeah. have been, they may well have been told that. That's my concern. Yeah. They may well have been told that, and somebody in government may have said, "Be like, look, we're gonna we're gonna end up passing law to find you." I'm not saying they weren't told that. It's another question of, like, you know, is that, you know, in law, has it been properly and effectively put in the law? I certainly don't have it here in front of me as far as any regulation or anything like that goes. Um, but the point is this. It doesn't help that person who's standing in line to get on the plane because they may be 
you know, 100% right. They are 100% right. They're 100% within their rights. I have a right to go home to my country. And they're still told no. What are they going to do? Can you just imagine that they run onto the plane? They're going to get tasered if not shot. Yeah. Uh, you know? Sorry, so, I shouldn't laugh. I mean, but... that ain't going to help. Yeah. You know what happens if you start jumping up and down and raising your voice near an airplane, right? And, uh, I, you know, I kind of get that, right? So it's not like you're going to be able to do anything right there. You can't call Mark Pettingill or whoever and say, talk to this agent and tell him about my rights. This is going to say, yeah, sorry, I'll, like, that's not going to do anything for you. Sorry, so don't call me because I can't yeah. help, right? All you're right, going to have Mark, to yeah. go through the rigmarole of bringing a court case, yeah. you know? So it's the ability for let's just go ahead and do it anyway because why? The majority of people will just acquiesce yeah. and follow along. Thank you That's so much, Mark. I appreciate right. it. Now, go enjoy your, your Father's Day. Uh, to Let all the go. listeners, we're going to take a quick take quick little uh, music break, and then we'll be back on the other side to take some calls. Again, the hotline's 232-1033. From over pandemic Under the pressure Under the pressure Them say six feet apart Every face of a mass pandemic Yeah, get a boom Yeah, get a boom People can't bear the cost Doctor can't find the cause Of the strict martial law pandemic It's a serious time I and I, 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 I give thanks I'm alive I never panic now I must survive I feel protect the inner peace of your mind Long time we tell you Now it's a serious time I and I, 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 I give thanks I'm alive I never panic now, I must survive I let a change right in front of you guys Where do I start? Not for them not clean in them, my name in the mat All them go a good, good school and never smart No for who not wear disguise before they start Mask you are wearing still a bark for protection Don't worry, I won't be seated in your section Cause I will never in my life get injection Monday vaccine, passport for win election That are the next thing, trust me, oh Something not right, how can you be so naive? Let the media control, but you believe me, but please You show on my mind there is no time to ease Cause it's a serious, serious, a serious time I and I, 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 I give thanks I'm alive I never panic now, I must survive I a change right in front of your eyes Do you have your state of mind? Yes, depression at all time Check on your brother if him doing alright In these unprecedented times Lock up in the house and life no tax free Them won't give me big fit test them vaccine It's a big money scheme this COVID-19 The sickness I move at lightning max speed Let me tell you no serious time I and I and I and I give thanks for my life I never panic no I must survive I feel protect the inner peace of your mind Long time we tell you no serious time I and I and I and I give thanks for my life I never panic no I must survive Good morning, Hello? 503, you're online. Oh, hi. Um, I was just listening to the conversation earlier about the um, person coming in and the travel authorization and if it's just Bermuda. I just flew in yesterday from Orlando, and I just wanted to let everybody know it's not just Bermuda. It was people traveling internationally. They had to show proof from their country their authorization to go back home. Okay, so, great. Thank you so much. So I had, I, there was people in line with us that were traveling to Antigua. Some people were traveling to Bahamas, and each one had to show their documentation from their country before they could even go to check in. So I don't think it's just from your government. 
Yeah, but, but what what are the what are the stipulations for the authorization? Because I think everyone's been traveling with travel authorization throughout the whole pandemic. Mm-hmm. That that's been a consistent theme. But but the difference is the conditions of that travel authorization. Because and, until today, you know, you just needed a negative COVID test to get your authorization. Right, and, and that's what right. that's what ours had to show, and and. Um, I know the gentleman that was in front of us was flying to Antigua, so he had to show his negative result and his um, form from his government. Right, and but but, what I'm, but now our government is saying you also have to now you have to show that you've paid for a two week stay in a hotel uh, if you yeah, haven't taken a- the COVID jab, and that that's where the concern comes in. Oh, uh, I thought that the caller was just saying that um, they weren't allowed to board the flight because. It was Bermuda government saying they couldn't, but I think it's every country. So every country obviously has different. Um, oh right, rules. right, right, yeah. right. Has a different set of rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I but guess what I just, what the caller was trying to get is is that they were told that by the airline that you know if the airline breaks the rules that the government has given them, they can be fined five thousand dollars. Right, and but so, I think it's every country, not just Bermuda government. I think it right. can be fined by every country. By every country, that's what you're saying. Yeah, if they don't look at the proper documentation from every country, maybe that's the fines that are in place. That's yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I just wanted to. You say wanted that, to so. say that, but well, thank you very much for calling in. Give thanks. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, and obviously, you know, we're, again, the lines are open, 232-1033. Um, mm. If you want to call in, comment. Um, obviously, a lot went down on Friday as far as uh, the House of Assembly, and um, there's a lot of Bermudians that are concerned right now, and rightfully so. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I know there are a couple things that I would like to, to hit on. I mean, I know that that some of the things that were discussed on Friday was the police ticketing. And it was made known that... Now, I don't know where it stands. Um, so any listeners, again, if you would like to correct me or elaborate on it, but it's basically where a uniformed police officer can stop you and ask for your ID. And the reason why they've stopped you is because they believe that you're not following the COVID regulations. And they will issue, a, issue you a ticket. You then have 48 hours. And this is Minister Wilson actually said this. You then have 48 hours to, sit, to request to pay that ticket within an additional 28 days. If that ticket is not paid within 56 days, you then will go to court. And if you are convicted, it will be on your criminal record. And this is something that was tabled in the House of Assembly on Friday. And it blew my mind. So, so what, is that, what is that legislation or policy um, aiming to address? That's where it was all uncertain. And, and one of the questions, I don't know who it was in the house, someone had asked, um, so the person that stops you, this uh, police officer, does he have to show his ID? And there was a moment of silence because Minister Wilson was not quite sure how to actually answer that question. But then she eventually came back and said, if it is a uniformed police officer, they don't have to show their ID, but you do. If it's an un- ununiformed police officer, they don't. They have to show ID. They don't have to. It was. It was confusing. No, but what, was what I'm of, saying, what what is it? What what are the police trying to stop you for? Exactly, and that's where the transparency was missing because apparently, based on what I was hearing, because again, it was it, it was quite confusing and alarming all at the uh, same time. Are they talking about like skipping and quarantine? Was, is no, it social just, distancing? What what is, what is it? No, apparently it was. Potentially, again, don't quote me again because the transparency wasn't there. They can just stop you on the street. And they'll say, we're stopping you because we believe your mask is not above your nose or you're breaking a COVID, COVID rule. And then you're then issued a, a ticket. Yeah. With then, 
and this is this is what this was what this is what makes me nervous. And then another topic that was that was spoken about was the fines jumping from fifteen hundred up to ten thousand dollars. The real question should be is is has anybody actually been um, made to pay any of these fines? Has anybody because the, the real question behind the scenes is is any of this legal? You know, so what I'm hearing from the community, from people who are looking into this, is that things like this are being tabled. You know, people are being given tickets or taken to, or, you know, or whatnot. But is anybody actually being punished for any of this? You know, because there are real questions around illegalities. Exactly. To yeah. the point where, again, it looks like these are just threats that are being thrown out to people, even though it's recognized that it's not legal. But until it's challenged, you know, it would stand. And so that's something that we have to be careful about in the community is just embracing these mandates that come down the pipeline without exactly. even really like testing the legality of them. Exactly. Because if everybody just agrees and starts doing it, then it's fine. You know, but a lot of these things, if they're challenged, they have nothing to stand on. You know, we're, we're, we'll take a call. Five one three, you're live. Uh, good, good day, good day. Thank you um, and all your listeners. Appreciate uh, your input and your opinions. Um, yeah, I just want to put my my, uh, my hat in the ring with the regards to uh, the the fine without even um, uh, without the police officer saying all uh, their badge number, their name. If if and when they arrest you and they take you to court, that information is going to be privy to you anyway. So I don't understand the, the logistics of of what Kim Wilson tabled in the Senate and the, the 30 ministers approved with not one um, objectifying it. Yeah, Mr. Pierman hummed and hawed about it, but he, he had no objections, you know. Um, and, and uh, you know, if you let time go by and people react, and uh, let, let's say if we do a march or a rally to protest against the government's decisions, these mandated and now legislative laws, which are enacted over the citizens, the citizens can still objectify against that, just, just like slavery, just like um, homosexuality, just like, just like all these things. Um, we can still fight it, and we will fight it, just like uh, Eugene says. It, you know, there's no precedent set to it. So r regardless of uh, what the uh, ministers put into legislation, um, it's also up to the police officers to enforce. Um, so my, my question, for, for anyone who can answer this, um, um, a police officer, a judge, or um, a, a lawyer, is um, what will happen to the police officers who don't choose to enforce these legislations, and also um, what will happen if we do have a rally or a march and a thousand or, or, you know, God willing, 5,000 people show up to this rally, how, how are these police officers meant to manage this? This is a, a, an objection to what these um, so-called political leaders, right, are, are positioning um, one segment of the uh, uh, population against the other. Now, if I was vaccinated, I am not. I, I'm totally against the, the vaccine agenda. I'm totally against uh, doctors, celebrities, random people on social media posting to take a, an unproven, un-FDA, unregulated, untested inoculation that alters your DNA. It's gene therapy, guys. This is gene therapy that alters your DNA, right? Your spike protein is, is your body, okay? If you um, refuse to do a saliva test because your saliva is part of your DNA, therefore it's part of your body, if you refuse to do a saliva test, then that's your right. If, if someone's changing your DNA on a molecular level, that's your right to object that. Especially if it's a uh, special use authorization. Now, um, the doctor um, that, that the, the doctor you had on um, that lives in Florida resides yep, in Florida. Yeah, Dr. Stillman. Yep. Doctor, he, he's a, he seems very very educated in knowledge. Um, w the one thing that he was lacking was 
the uh, which is probably nothing to do his fault, but the uh, FDA, um, the, the, the FDA is, is 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 a group of doctors, right? A, a group of of seriously trained people, um, and they knew that the inoculation would leave the injection site. They knew that the spike protein will go into every single organ of the person's body. They even knew that it was going to cross the blood-brain barrier. They even knew that it was going to um, reside in women's ovaries and men's prostate at a higher level than many other organs to cause infertility. This is known. There's doctors that have done the research uh, prior, months and months ago. And uh, uh, the FDA knows this. My question is, is how extensive would our government's research before implementing this island-wide, quote-unquote, vaccination, this gene therapy? I want to know what resources did Kim Wilson and many of the other um, in charge of the hospital board have information on hand to say that this is our hope, right? Now, because ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine work, they've been working for nearly 30 years in third world countries, right? They, they, ha- they have not been approved for human trials, but they still have a long track record of positive results without altering your DNA at a, a subatomic level, right? Now, I, I apologize if this, if this offends some of your listeners, right? Um, but the reality is we are in an uncharted territory. No government will uh, tip their hat and say, oops, we made a mistake on this. We need stronger action. We need help from other countries. We need uh, an extreme reform on our health ministry and also our legislative... Um, there's no way that 30 people can dictate the life of 64,000 people in our country to what the extent they have done, right? Um, forced quarantining on a virus that was uh, gene-edited and funded by the U.S. government, the, the FDA and the CDC and many other universities um, throughout the United States and the world paid for funding for this gene therapy um, um, virus to, it's called gain of function. They have been doing this since 2013, 2014. They have patented the coronavirus. This coronavirus that we have been um, dealing with the last two years is a patented virus. They have the PCR test that can supposedly only detect the, 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 the novel coronavirus, uh, i.e. COVID-19. They're, they're patented. They were patented in 2017. This is an engineered virus by humans, and our, our courts and our laws and our government are treating it as if it is not man-made. And therefore, yes, their laws and their um, uh, uh, rights of controlling their people stand. But with the new information that came out through the leak of Fauci's emails, with this, with the head of the with U.S. Congress saying that Fauci's fired, and he is, and along with other people from the World Health Organization, um, also funded gain of function in China because it was banned and outlawed once they realized the implications of uh, uh, genetically modifying through gain of function the novel coronavirus. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's Thank good. Thank you so much. Yeah, but give thanks for sharing all that. And I just, I appreciate that. And, you know, the sentiment in the community, people are very passionate. So thank you, Caller, for calling in just now. That because, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a serious thing. And new information is emerging all the time. So we're going to play a clip right now. Um, it's a conversation being had by an American biologist. Um, an American entrepreneur and um, Dr. Robert W. Malone, MD, who is the discoverer of 
in vitro and in, vi in vivo RNA transfection and the inventor of mRNA vaccines. Um, he did this while he was at the Salk Institute in 1988. So it's, it's, it's very interesting what is happening in this conversation. Obviously, we're not able to play the whole conversation, but we're going to play a little three-minute, three- or four-minute clip so you can hear some of it. Just give us one second. We're yeah, just let trying me try to look that it up. again. Yeah. Oops. Let's see. Again, if you're just tuning in, uh, you could listen to vibe103.com on Chrome or Safari, also on TuneIn uh, or on the app. Um, you could reach me. The, the show is actually called The Outlet. And you can reach me at on all in, all on all social media platforms, DNA the outlet BDA, um, and also I, I please don't forget beyondthepandemic.tv. They just released um, series number five, episode number five. Sorry, um, on beyondthepandemic.tv that Eugene has put together, um, and I just want to thank everybody for tuning in today and thank you to all the callers and obviously there's a lot of uh, mixed emotions and sadness and anger and um, people's hearts are heavy and what do they say stress is probably one of the number one killers um, so it's just been unfortunate for what we're all having to go through right now where it seems as those six or eight months into the pandemic you know, everyone said, oh, you know, by 2021, everything's going to be fantastic. We're going to be back to normal. Oh, my gosh, I can't wait. Um, you know, and it just seems like everything's just gotten worse. But there is light. There is light. And, you know, the whole point of being here and starting the outlet is because we want people to be able to have an outlet, to talk, to voice their opinions, to not be judged, whether you're vaccinated or vaccinated, um, you know, and... At the end of the day, we really just want, like Sophia said, love conquers all and so does unity. And at the end of the day, we want just everyone to be reunited again, love again. And she also said, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. It really is. It is actually okay to make mistakes. And you are so well respected when you've made a mistake and you just apologize. And I even think as much anger that has grown around this whole situation, and in particular with this mandatory quarantining that's just been implement, implemented, it's still okay, you know? It's okay to say sorry. It's okay to, to make a mistake. It's just how we learn. And at the, I mean, coming, I mean, we're all humans. And I feel like we're just losing touch with that. You know, we are humans and we do have feelings and... We do, we do just, we want to love again and be free again and, and not be judged. I mean, not have to walk down the road and think, oh my gosh, I'm not wearing my mask, but that person is. So are they going to think that I'm not vaccinated or am I vaccinated? You know, it's just this whole stigma around everything. But again, I think we actually have the technology um, sorted. Eugene, um, <laughs> he's going to play a little clip. Yeah. Yeah. We're just going to play this yeah. clip. And um, yeah. DNA vaccines, not the RNA vaccines, which is what we were talking about. I would, I would call it. It's not a DNA vaccine. It's an ad vector vaccine. Right. It's a. It's a not. It is the use of the a recombinant virus, which happens to be a DNA virus. Yeah. But it's the same basic idea. It's gene therapy technology applied to vaccines. Okay. It's the same technology, and everything downstream of the translation of the spike protein is, is the same. Spike protein. Yeah. Is, <laughs> is the same. And and by the way, we have no problems at all with mRNA vaccines. Right. It's just this particular vaccine, because of the spike protein and because it breaks, it cleaves off the cell and it goes throughout your body and your brain, your heart, and you know, anywhere that you can have these symptoms that are so varied, whether it's a 16-year-old 
who can't talk or see 48 hours after injection or, or someone who's, you know, handshakes or someone who's, um, you know, my carpet cleaner, uh, uh, Tim, he's like disabled now. He's lost $30,000 in terms of the, his costs and he's going in for an epidural because he's in such pain. And so these, and these well, side effects, the, the, the victims of this, of, of this vaccine, they're not being able to tell their story at the press because, you know, Tim says, I, I try to tell my story and the press ignores him. And we have these, um, uh, these groups that, uh, aren't able to get uh, attention. Aren't able to get attention. A large group of people who uh, believe that they have suffered negative consequences was removed from Facebook. So there's very clearly an effort yeah, to, to 200,000 users just wiped off the, right. the planet, right? Now, if, if there are no, if this is a perfectly safe so, vaccine. So the censoring has been going on for well over a year. It's well documented. It's unequivocal. And they my, 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 ar about. my argument is that um, by implementing censoring, what we're doing is making it so that signals can't be detected. Yeah. People's voices can't be heard. And I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we have to have free and open discussion and we have to have full disclosure of risks. And when you censor that, you cannot have that. It, change, yeah, it changes everybody's mindset into believing it's safe and, and, and effective. And when you have that, you don't report these adverse events as being associated so with that's, it because you, right. you eliminate that's, that's it. That's you don't the, want to be the fly in the ointment well, of no, a great you, vaccine. No, you don't think yeah. it's possible, right? right? So when a doctor sees... A, a miscarriage and says, I've never seen a, a baby like this in my entire career where it's so bloody and the brain is split in half and so forth. She's never seen anything like it. And she, and, and the woman was vaccinated a month ago and she's 25 weeks pregnant. When you have that sort of thing, the doctor says, well, it can't be the vaccine because the vaccine is safe. Well, and so they, they say, well, it must be a genetic defect. And they report it as a genetic defect, and they don't even report it into the VARA system. So we never see any of these safety signals because everybody is trained to think that it's safe. It couldn't have been yeah, the vaccine. So that's that's this group thing problem. So and, I, and I think we it is a real problem. Here's what they're going to say. So and and I, I want to. So you get into this group thing problem, which is what. They were talking about there and um you know we want to be accepted we want to be we want to feel as if you know we, we want people to like us <laughs> you know what i mean so it's 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 a very difficult situation when you have something that is getting widespread support and then you start to feel indifferent because for whatever reason you don't agree. And unless you're someone who has been trained or who has learned through experience to be fiercely independent, it's a very difficult position to be in. It's extremely uncomfortable, you know? And so what we tend to do is we just adopt the common thought patterns and processes. And, and, and we've done this for so long that we do it mindlessly now. It's a very subconscious action. It's not, a, it's not conscious. It just happens automatically because we've literally trained ourselves to engage the group thought. And, and that's what's going on, even in the medical profession, because we, we have to recognize that professionals are people. Mm -hmm. Mark Pettengill is a lawyer, but at the end of the day, he's a person. Yeah, he's a human being. Yeah, and then he'll be a father, he'll be a husband, and all those things. Friend. Just a friend, everything, yep. just like everyone else. So, so doctors go to home, they, they have to cook, they take their trash out, they use the bathroom, everything. It's, it's the same. They have brothers, they have sisters, aunts, and uncles. They have grandparents, you know, that tell them off. They've got parents that put them in line, and all of those things. They have family pressures and all of that. And, and just because you're a doctor, or just because you're a lawyer, or any other professional... It doesn't mean that you have conquered, right, all life lessons and developed into the supreme being. That's why they call it practice. Yeah. So, so everyone can fall victim to the group thought. And, and just how they were explaining, if the group thought suggests that 
the vaccine is safe, then that's what it is. And no matter what you see in front of you, you've already resigned to that. that that's the conclusion. And so you don't even consider it. While someone who is outside of that realm, who's thinking independently and critically, is like, what do you mean? How can you not see this? You know, but those of us who tend to be outside of the mainstream thought processes are used to being misunderstood. Mm -hmm. It's just part of life. You know? Yeah. As an outsider, and number 341 recovered person in Bermuda, mm -hmm. um, in the 50s, pregnant women were being x-rayed to check on the health of their fetuses for many years until it was discovered that the x-rays and the radiation was causing cancer. Oops, better stop doing that. In the 60s, thalidomide was given to pregnant women to assist with their nausea and morning sickness. Worked well for that until the babies started coming out with no limbs. Oops, better stop doing that for a few years. In the 70s and 80s, misoprostol, an ulcer medication, was uh, used to, uh, to induce labor. Women were dying. Babies were dying. Women were having hysterectomies. Oops, better stop using that. Now the cesarean rate is over 50% because people are been fearful and not given their... They've, they've not used their brains. They've not used their benefits of this, of this situation. What are the risks? What are the alternatives? What is their instinct telling them? Do they have to do it now? Is it necessary? And is it safe? Use your brains. What are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? What is your instinct telling you? Do you have to do it now? Is it necessary? And is it safe and satisfactory? Use your brains. Thank you so much, Sophia. Eugene, mm. any closing remarks? Are you good? <laughs> <laughs> I know we could go on all day. Yeah, but, we, um, could, you know. we could go on all day. So, yeah, yeah, so I just want to thank Eugene for coming in. Thank you to Dr. Stillman. Thank you to Sophia. Thank you so much to all of our listeners. Um, Mark Pettingill. Mark Pettingill. Sorry, Mark, <laughs> I forgot you. Um, you can send me a bill. No. <laughs> um, but no, thank you again, guys. And at the end of the day, you know, please, please, let's just come together. Everybody is going through a very, very, very difficult time. Again, we are all humans. Let's love again. Let's unite. Let's keep staying strong. And please don't fear anything. If you have anything that you want to report, good, bad, you know, reach out to Sophia, you know, on, on, what, what I have the information. Naturally. Here. Yes, there you go. COVID immunity Bermuda for both people. For everyone. Yes. Everyone. And, yes. And it, grassroots local reporting in the number 7996330. Do not feel like you are alone. I promise you, there are so many people that will be behind you. Do not fear anything. I know it takes a lot of courage. It really does. Um, but please, and just remember to tune in on um, beyondthepandemic.tv. Again, Eugene released episode five, um, which he will continue to release. I think there's about nine or ten of them, Eugene. Well, yeah, with the medical profession. And then yeah. we're going to go into the private sector and talk to entrepreneurs yeah. as well. But I just wanted to say, if anybody wants to get involved, um, if you love the program and you want to support, just down the bottom of the website, it's a button that says help us grow. And, and, and you can use that to, to help to support us, to continue with the project. And, um, and again, I want to thank all the brave um, health professionals who have come on and told our stories to the general public. Yeah, and, It's and also, really been appreciated. Yeah, and also remember, we're, we're welcome both sides. Both sides. You know, yeah. anybody. And then hopefully next week, you all will tune in again to the outlet between 10 and 12. I mean, we never seem to end at 12. It's It's always so many hot topics to to talk about but uh sophia and i were actually aiming on coming in next sunday i don't know if Gigi, if eugene's gonna be brave enough there's gonna be a lot of women in the room but uh yeah so we're, we're anticipating female energy yeah, is we're, rising yeah we're, we're anticipating on touching on some hot topics but 
as you know, every day, every hour, every minute, every second is, is always changing. So uh, I look forward to hearing, uh, sorry, I look forward to, to, to having all of you tune in again next Sunday. And again, thank you so much. And please be brave. I promise you there's nothing to be scared of. You have a lot of people that will support you. Let's come, to, let's come together, Bermuda. And as Cynthia Arrivo says, stand up.